Welcome to Manhua Empire Recap, your go-to channel for Manhua stories. Hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and join us on our journey through the pages of adventures. Get ready for the magic of Manhua like never before. Enjoy watching. In the bustling world of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, a sensation was taking the financial world by storm. It was an app, unlike any other, that allowed users to gamble their hard-earned money on the ever-volatile crypto market. As the app's popularity grew, so did the intensity of emotions among its users. Some people became aggressive when they lost their money, cursing their luck and the unforgiving market. But what really sent shockwaves through the community was when the value of the cryptocurrency plummeted by a staggering 80%. This was no ordinary market dip, and the gamblers were livid. Fingers were pointed at an organization believed to manipulate cryptocurrency prices. Some refused to accept that corruption existed within the system, thinking it was merely the result of market fluctuations. However, others were convinced of how corrupt and political the cryptocurrency world had become. The debate raged on, leaving the community divided. Little did the gamblers know that the puppeteers manipulating the market did indeed exist. These shadowy figures watched from the shadows, amused by the chaos they had sown. The manipulators had a well-practiced tactic. They selected a cryptocurrency with a captivating name, lured unsuspecting investors, and pumped the charts to create a false sense of security. As more and more investors poured in, thinking they were about to strike it rich, the manipulators executed their ultimate deception. One of the masterminds behind this grand manipulation scheme was Chairman Young Pilgu. The manipulators, led by Chairman Young Pilgu, knew that timing was everything. Chairman Young Pilgu's organization was a well-oiled machine, with one of his most trusted employees being Yu Bam. Bam was a master of manipulating investors, and Pilgu couldn't have been prouder to have him by his side. Pilgu often thought about rewarding Bam with extravagant gifts like expensive cars. But Bam had a different desire, he wanted cold, hard cash. Their conversation took an unexpected turn when Pilgu's bodyguard, always vigilant to protect the chairman's honor, intervened, thinking Bam was being disrespectful. However, Pilgu admired Bam's bravery for speaking his mind. He approached Bam, privately commending him for his honesty. In a hushed tone, Pilgu promised Bam the cash he desired, but there was a catch. The scene took a dark turn as a captive man was revealed, bound and gagged beside Pilgu. Pilgu ordered Bam to harm the man, sending shivers down the spines of those present. Later that day, the duct tape sealing the man's mouth was ripped off, and he gasped for breath. One of Pilgu's underlings, skilled in the art of intimidation, took the lead in interrogating the trembling captive. The captive confessed that their organization's office address had been leaked through their group chat, signed under the mysterious username X. He pleaded for his life, desperation in his eyes. Explaining that the 300 million one he had lost was meant for his daughter's life-saving operation. A glimmer of sympathy flickered in the underling's eyes upon hearing about the man's daughter. The captive, clinging to this glimmer of hope, thought that the underling was genuinely moved by his plight. But then, in an instant, the underling's demeanor shifted. He no longer appeared to buy the man's story. Instead, he raised his foot menacingly, ready to deliver a brutal kick to the man's face. As Bam arrived at the scene, he glanced at the captive man with a cold and calculating demeanor. He had no sympathy for the man's plight and believed that the man was spewing lies. Bam was well informed, and he knew that the captive had no daughter and was actually a sex offender who had evaded charges. With a nonchalant expression, Bam scolded the underling for his momentary lapse of sympathy, reminding him that small investors were not to be pitied. Bayam had a harsh perspective on those who ventured into the risky world of gambling. In his eyes, they were responsible for their own losses, and the organization held no culpability. Bayam approached the trembling sex offender, his face void of emotion. He believed that everyone had their reasons, and those who swindled the innocent deserved no mercy. The sex offender, aware that his life was hanging by a thread, he could only scream in terror. His cries echoed that night. After the gruesome incident, Chairman Young Pilgu fulfilled his promise to Yu Bayam, handing him the 300 million won. As Bayam stood by the sea, gazing out into the horizon, it was evident that he had aspirations beyond his role as the team leader in the vicious organization. There was a longing in his eyes, a desire for something different, but just as Bayam allowed himself to momentarily dream of freedom and escape from the clutches of the organization, the underlings called out his name, snapping him back to reality. 
His hatred for those who had led him into this dark world burned deep within him. They were the ones responsible for his current predicament. Five years earlier, Yu Bam had been a bright college student at Hankook University, one of South Korea's most prestigious institutions. In that moment, Yu Bam found himself immersed in a challenging math subject class at Hankook University. He had excelled in his studies, particularly in mathematics, and was known for his remarkable problem-solving skills. Yu Bam was a dedicated third-year economics student at Hankook University. He had excelled in his studies, particularly in mathematics. Bam's professor, though impressed, was also somewhat terrified of the young prodigy's intellect. Bam had a deep sense of confidence in his abilities, often solving complex equations in his mind without the need for scratch paper. His peers whispered about his intelligence, and some made harsh comments to mask their own insecurities. Amidst the skepticism and jealousy, one girl in his class stood out. She admired Bayam's intellectual prowess and found him genuinely captivating. After one of their class periods, she mustered the courage to call his name. Her sweetness and sincerity struck a chord with Bayam. She invited Bayam to join a club that she was a part of, hoping to spend more time with him. Bam, however, awkwardly declined her offer, citing the need to attend to errands and financial responsibilities. Bam couldn't escape the whispers and teasing from his classmates. They playfully mocked him, accusing him of being obsessed with earning money. However, as his classmates turned their backs on him and enjoyed the camaraderie of a seemingly privileged life, Bam couldn't help but feel a pang of envy. He yearned for the simplicity of their lives where success was not measured solely by academic achievements and financial aspirations. Walking away from the opinions and judgments of others, Bayam knew that his problems wouldn't be solved by what others thought of him. Yu Bam, like a typical Asian big brother, Bayam worked tirelessly as a server on weekends, saving every bit of his earnings to pay for Sung Ah's academy fees. His goal was to make four payments in a single month, ensuring that he could keep at least 20 million won in his pocket. He was content knowing that he had saved at least 300,000 won, a small treat for himself amidst his responsibilities. But later that day, Bam's world came crashing down when he had a conversation with his father. His father had used all of Bam's hard-earned savings, a total of 20 million won. Bam was not pleased with his father's reckless actions, feeling a profound sense of betrayal. It was then that Bam discovered that his father had also fallen victim to the cryptocurrency scam, just like the small investors he had come to despise. Bam's heart shattered upon hearing that his money had been wasted on such a futile endeavor. His father wore a twisted sense of pride on his face. He boasted about the extent of his recklessness, revealing that he had not only squandered Bam's hard-earned savings, but had also used their mother's retirement money. With a look of disgust on his face, Bayam confronted his father, his anger boiling over. He attacked his own flesh and blood, unable to contain his fury at his father's foolishness. But to his ignorant father, Bayam was merely being a brat. In a fit of rage, his father slapped Bayam, further deepening the chasm between them. His father audaciously compared Bayam to children from wealthier families who bought cars for their parents, as if this justified his reckless actions. Just as tensions reached their peak, Sung Ah uh, arrived at the scene. She, in her innocence and love for her big brother, declared that she would forego her dream of attending a music university to lessen Bam's burden. Bam's heart ached to hear his baby sister willing to sacrifice her dreams due to their father's stupidity. However, their father's recklessness knew no bounds. He rashly slapped Sung Ah, who had only wanted to help her family. Bam immediately rushed to his sister's side, offering her comfort and protection. Their father, in a manic outburst of loud, incomprehensible words, dared his children to believe that he would turn their lives around by making a miraculous five billion one in just one week. In the end, Bam's father took the cowardly way out, escaping without taking responsibility for the financial ruin he had caused. His sudden death left Bam and his baby sister drowning in a sea of debt, a legacy of their father's foolishness. To Bam and his family, it appeared as though their father had taken the easy way out by choosing to end his own life. Just as they were grieving and trying to come to terms with the turmoil, an unexpected visitor disrupted their father's funeral. This unwelcome guest turned out to be a thug, seeking to reclaim the three million won their father had borrowed, with a looming deadline set for the following week. The thug's menacing presence hung over their family like a dark cloud, threatening dire consequences if they failed to make amends. 
As if their hardships weren't enough, tragedy struck once more when their mother was hospitalized due to the shock of the family's dire financial situation. The mounting hospital bills only added to their already crippling debt. To compound their misfortunes, Bam's baby sister, Sun Ah, lost her hearing due to the trauma she had endured. Her dreams of attending a music university were cruelly shattered, and her world grew silent. Bayam, who had once shown great potential as a genius, had no choice but to abandon his education. He threw himself into an exhausting routine of odd jobs, including waiting tables and taking on backbreaking labor. In the darkest moments of his life, Bayam bore the brunt of the thug's wrath when he couldn't meet the debt repayment deadline. His world had been torn apart by the cryptocurrency system, which he had come to despise with a burning hatred, as it was the catalyst for the relentless misery that had befallen his family. Bam's life had taken a cruel turn, he worked at Gangnam's high-class pubs, where he would tragically sleep in a storeroom for just two hours once his exhausting shift was done, only to begin his labor work at dawn. Despite his soul feeling drained, Bam did his best to maintain professionalism. As he walked away from the pub, his ears perked up to overhear a conversation among customers who appeared to be working on a sinister scheme. To his shock, one of the customers was none other than Chairman Young Pilgu from the Cryptocurrency Manipulation Organization. Pilgu brazenly bragged about his ill-gotten wealth, boasting of having earned three billion won from his scams. Bam felt his blood run cold, realizing that fate had brought him face to face with the person partially responsible for his family's suffering. Pilgu seemed to be in the midst of recruiting employees for his organization, and callously ridiculed his victims, calling them weak and foolish for falling prey to his schemes, he showed no remorse for the people who had been driven to despair and suicide due to his actions. Pilgu's utter lack of remorse and his audacity to mock those who had been driven to commit suicide because of his scams struck a nerve deep within Bam. Bayam's anger and hatred towards Pilgu intensified, the memory of his own family's pain and struggles brought about by Pilgu's actions and fueled a burning desire for revenge within him. Chairman Young Pilgu displayed a level of arrogance. He couldn't resist sharing his disdain for those who had gambled away billions of won, viewing them with contemptuous amusement. As Bayam held a bottle of champagne in his hands, a surge of anger and frustration threatened to overwhelm him. The temptation to give in to his rage and smash the bottle over Chairman Young Pilgu's head consumed him. His grip tightened and his blood boiled with rage. When Pilgu called his name, Bam managed to discipline himself. He realized that murdering Pilgu in the heat of the moment would only lead to more trouble. As Bam locked eyes with Chairman Young Pilgu in that intense moment, he made a solemn vow to himself that he would never let an opportunity for revenge slip through his fingers. Instead, he devised a cunning plan to gather information from Pilgu and bide his time for the perfect moment to seek revenge. It was a display of incredible self-control and determination driven by a burning desire to make Pilgu pay for his crimes. He acted innocently, offering the bottle of alcohol for free to Pilgu. It was a tactical move to get his special name card list, allowing him to be selected as a special customer. Pilgu had his doubts about the fancy pub giving away alcohol for free. But in the end, he handed over his card. With Chairman Young Pilgu's special name card list in his possession, Bayam had taken a significant step toward his ultimate goal of seeking revenge and bringing Pilgu to justice. He knew that it would be a long and careful process, but it was a risk he was willing to take to gather intelligence and uncover the inner workings of Pilgu's cryptocurrency manipulation organization. Bayam took a deep breath, reminding himself that he had a responsibility to his baby sister, Sung Ah, who depended on him for support and protection. The thought of Pilgu labeling his victims as idiots infuriated him. In the midst of his pursuit of revenge against Chairman Young Pilgu, Pilgu was somewhat right because of Bayam's own father had been one of those victims, a fact that he couldn't deny. The corrupt laughter of the rich echoed in Bayam's mind. As he disappeared into the night, driven by a burning determination to make those responsible for his family's suffering pay for their crimes, Bam embarked on a rigorous research journey, immersing himself in the intricacies of cryptocurrencies. Bam realized that knowledge would be his most potent weapon. Bam realized that he needed more than just knowledge to take on Chairman Young Pilgu and the cryptocurrency manipulation organization. He needed physical skills and the ability to defend himself in the dangerous world he was entering. He seized an opportunity by working as a waiter at the high-class pub that Pilgu and his team frequented. This allowed him to gather critical information and plant a bug at their table discreetly. 
Over the course of three long and painstaking years, he had learned a wealth of information about the inner workings of the cryptocurrency manipulation organization. Bam had finally completed his plan to destroy the infamous cryptocurrency manipulation organization led by Chairman Young Pilgu. In the midst of Bayam's meticulously planned revenge, Bayam crossed paths with the thug to whom his father had been indebted. The thug, unaware of the transformation Bayam had undergone, decided to test his resolve and intimidate him. The thug took a dangerous turn when the thug went too far by mentioning Sung Ah and threatening to harm her. The mention of Sung Ah and the threat against her ignited a fire within Bayam that was more intense than anything he had ever felt. In that critical moment, Bayam's anger flared, and he seized the thug by the neck with a grip that left no room for doubt. His voice was steely and filled with menace as he warned the thug of the consequences of his foolishness. Bayam made it clear that harming Sung Ah was not an option, and anyone who dared to do so would face his wrath. As the confrontation unfolded, it was clear that Bayam's mission for revenge had taken on an even more personal dimension. The decision to get a full-back tattoo was not made lightly. It was a bold and deliberate choice. Fueled by a burning desire for revenge and justice, he made a profound decision to throw away his old life and embrace the role of the greater evil. He had uncovered the truth about Chairman Young Pilgu's organization that had operated under the guise of a trading company called One, serving as a cover for their elaborate cryptocurrency scamming schemes. It turned out that within Pilgu's company, the staff members were not just ordinary employees, and they used to be gangsters. As Bayam observed the luxurious building stood as a testament to the organization's success in deceiving and exploiting people, Bayam's blood boiled with anger and frustration. As Bayam stood in the shadow of Chairman Young Pilgu's opulent building, his expression remained nonchalant, belying the seething rage and determination that burned within him. Three months had passed since Bayam's fateful encounter with Chairman Young Pilgu, and he had taken a bold step in his quest for revenge and justice. In a daring move, Bayam had infiltrated Pilgu's organization by joining one. As Bayam went about his work within the company, he couldn't help but notice the absence of Chairman Pilgu's presence. One day, as Bayam was sweeping the floor, he found himself on the verge of entering a room labeled Peltic's Coin. However, his actions did not go unnoticed. He was confronted by a staff member named Yomingu, a member of the strategy team 2 at 1. He emphasized the importance of cleaning properly, but Bayam's mind was focused on a much larger mission. As Mingu continued to berate him, Bayam chose to ignore him, a decision that further infuriated Mingu. In a fit of anger, Mingu decided to resort to violence and launched an attack against Bayam. However, Bayam observed every flaw in Mingu's movements. With swift precision, he defended himself. In a matter of moments, Mingu found himself stumbling to the ground, overpowered by Bayam's superior fighting abilities. Bayam believed that strategy and skill could overcome any physical disadvantage, and his defense had proven that to be true. His years as a fighter had transformed him into a formidable adversary, capable of holding his own, even within the organization he aimed to dismantle. After successfully defending himself against Mingu's attack, Bayam offered a sarcastic apology, claiming that his defense had been a mere reflex. Mingu, still smarting from the embarrassment of stumbling to the ground, was triggered by Bayam's words. Undeterred by Mingu's attempts at intimidation, Bayam merely glared at him. It was clear that Bayam had his own agenda and was unafraid of Mingu's bluster. In the end, Mingu decided to walk away, seemingly preoccupied with his own plans for the day, however. Just as Mingu was about to leave, Bayam informed Mingu that it was an opportune moment to enter the Peltic's coin room. A statement that left Mingu surprised and intrigued. Bayam repeated his statement to drive home the point, making it clear that he was not mistaken or hallucinating that the Peltic's coin had been steadily falling. As Bayam delved deeper into the intricacies of the cryptocurrency system, he shared his knowledge with Yomingu, explaining the significance of breaking the resistance line in terms of power. Bayam's insights suggested that the buying trend among investors would rise significantly if they could breach this crucial point. Unbeknownst to Bayam, a mysterious woman had been eavesdropping on their conversation. While Mingu struggled to grasp the concepts Bayam was discussing, Mingu, feeling insecure and perhaps a touch jealous of Bayam's intelligence, resorted to insulting him by referring to his janitorial role. Kim Myung, the team leader of Strategy Team 2, had overheard Bayam's explanation. As soon as she appeared, Mingu became nervous and attempted to shift the blame onto Bayam, claiming that he had made him late for a conference meeting. 
Mingu had expected Miyoung to side with him, but to his surprise, she was more interested in Bam than reprimanding him. Miyoung was fascinated by Bam's good looks and intrigued by his background, a former economics student at one of Korea's top universities. Because of Bam's background and the insights he had shared earlier, Miyoung decided to extend an unexpected opportunity to him. She invited Bam to join the conference meeting. Later on, as Kim Miyoung continued to lead the meeting, she emphasized that their cryptocurrency operations centered on the crystal coin. Miyoung pointed out that they were targeting a smaller cryptocurrency called Kim Chai Coin, which had a market capitalization of 30 billion and a daily trading volume of approximately 4 billion. She believed this environment presented a prime opportunity for manipulation. However, Miyoung also delivered a troubling revelation. She explained that the force responsible for accumulating coins before price manipulation had ceased to exist. Miyoung revealed that she was currently engaged in a bicycle trade, a method that involved inflating trading volume by buying and selling within the same account. It was a tactic designed to create the illusion of high market activity. As Bayam listened to the meeting, it became increasingly clear that the company had been meticulously planning how to extract money from unsuspecting victims. Their actions were not only unethical, but also illegal. In Bam's mind, sitting in a room full of these scammers was nauseating. He despised their ruthless exploitation of innocent investors and their willingness to manipulate the market for personal gain. This shift in circumstances meant that they needed a new strategy to raise prices and continue their operations successfully. Yomingu, appearing confident, proposed a high-risk solution, gambling with 10 billion won in the hopes of doubling their money. However, one of the team members challenged Mingu's suggestion head-on. He criticized Mingu's overconfidence and pointed out that growing money in the cryptocurrency market was not as simple as Mingu made it seem. This stinging remark left Mingu deeply offended, as he was accustomed to being the smartest in the room. The confrontation escalated as the team member openly criticized Mingu's competence and warned that if Mingu were to lead the operation, the company would be doomed. It was a clash of ideas and egos within the organization, revealing the internal strife and power struggles. Amidst the clash of ideas and egos within the meeting room, Yo Mingu was not willing to let go of his proposal, however. It was at this moment that Bayam decided to speak up and offered a counterproposal, suggesting that they bet 500,000 won instead. His words immediately grabbed the attention of both Mingu and Miyoung, who turned their focus toward him. With confidence and a calculated strategy, Bam explained that with just 500,000 won, he could triple their investment. He hoped that Mi Young would see the potential in his well thought out plan. Mingu, once again allowing his temper to flare, insulted Bam for being a newcomer to the discussion. However, Bam held his ground and argued that in order to lure victims into their schemes, they needed to lower the capital required. He believed that people had become more cautious and that the key to their success was ensuring that potential victims could easily participate. Despite Bayam's well-reasoned and calculated proposal, Yo Mingu remained obstinate and refused to acknowledge the validity of his words. Bayam had spent three years researching and mastering the inner workings of their system, a fact that Mingu was unaware of due to his ignorance. Mingu's frustration reached a breaking point, and he resorted to threats in an attempt to silence Bayam. However, Bam met his gaze with a defiant glare and a reminder that he had the means to fight back without resorting to physical actions. While Mingu remained obstinate in his stance and blinded by his own ego, Bam's confidence and determination to disrupt the fraudulent schemes of the organization were unwavering. Kim Myung decided to intervene and put an end to the heated debate between Yo Mingu and Bam. She expressed her concerns about Bam's strategy, considering it to be too risky. In her view, the primary reason for inviting Bam to the meeting was to provide him with insight into their organization's operations. Myung reluctantly agreed with Mingu's viewpoint that overusing one's knowledge in their line of work could lead to financial losses. She believed that caution and conservative strategies were essential to maintain success in the cryptocurrency manipulation business. Bam, however, refused to back down from his position. He criticized the organization for its lack of adaptability and reliance on outdated methods. He implied that their failure to evolve and think creatively had put them on the brink of collapse. This audacious challenge from Bam provoked further reactions. Mi Young was left speechless, unsure of how to respond to his criticism, while Mingu's frustration grew. Kim Mi Young remained skeptical and unconvinced of the feasibility of Bam's strategy. 
Suddenly, a voice from behind the call spoke up, surprising everyone in the room. This mysterious individual offered Bam a chance to implement his strategy. Mayung was taken aback, feeling the weight of the situation as she realized that their boss was on the line. The chairman of the organization, Pilgu, had been quietly listening to the conference meeting all along. He praised Bam for his academic background as a graduate of a prestigious university with an economics major. Chairman Pilgu's interest in Bayam's risky and unique idea was a turning point in the meeting. Pilgu, known for his ruthlessness and lack of tolerance for failure, gave Bayam a chance to prove the viability of his strategy for one week. The consequences of failure were dire, as Pilgu made it clear that those who disappointed him would end up as fish food in his tank. The chilling threat sent shivers down the spines of everyone in the room, as they knew that Pilgu's words were not metaphorical. Those who had failed him in the past had met gruesome fates, and the man currently inside the tank begged for his life as the fish circled hungrily. Pilgu revealed that the man in the tank had previously held the designer position, a role that Pilgu was willing to offer to Bayam if he succeeded in his challenge. Bayam's determination only grew upon hearing Pilgu's offer, and he was not intimidated by the consequences of failure. Bayam remembered his first encounter with Pilgu, which had filled him with a burning rage. However, he remained calm and composed, determined to achieve his goals and exact his revenge on the man he despised the most. When Pilgu asked Bam if he was willing to accept the deadly challenge, Kim Myung, deeply concerned, advised him to turn it down. But Bam, who feared nothing and was driven by his mission, accepted the challenge. After the intense and consequential conference meeting, it was finally adjourned. As he walked away from the intense conference meeting, Bam's mind was already in overdrive. With the chairman's challenge accepted and the clock ticking, Bam knew that he had just one week to succeed in his mission. As he went about his business, a new colleague approached him. To his surprise, it was Myung who offered him a ride. Bam agreed, expecting a friendly interaction. He informed Myung to drop him at the station where he'll take the train. However, as he settled into the car, he soon realized that this ride was anything but ordinary. His expectations were shattered when Myung revealed her true intentions, pointing a gun at him. Bam found himself at gunpoint, nervous and trapped in a dangerous situation. Myung disclosed that their company conducted background checks on all employees, and she had suspected Bam from the very beginning. Bam's shock and apprehension at finding himself in a car with Myung, who had just revealed herself as a potential threat with a gun in hand, were undeniable. Myung's suspicion of Bam had grown throughout their interaction. She found it highly unusual for a newcomer to be so confident and knowledgeable about the inner workings of their organization. Her suspicion led her to consider the possibility that Bam might be a spy from a rival company attempting to infiltrate and gather information. Little did Myung know that Bam had anticipated this very reaction deep down. He had hoped to arouse suspicion and draw her into his web of deception. Myung's unease had grown as she uncovered Bam's involvement in the world of coin prior to joining the organization. Bam had hidden this aspect of his life, and Myung was understandably concerned about what he might be hiding. Bam quickly explained that he hadn't intended to keep his past a secret. Bayam's explanation about his prior research into the organization was a calculated move, designed to cast himself in a more trustworthy light. In his perspective, he had thoroughly researched the company before joining, studying every detail about one. He gained knowledge about the various types of forces that operated within this shadowy world. The coin board was far from a straightforward marketplace. It was a complex, multi-level pyramid scheme of power, where different factions vied for control and influence. He had discovered that years ago, even gangsters had been drawn to the allure of money and had entered the world of coin. Within the realm of coin, there were three major organizations that ruled the roost. One was one of them, along with the Three Sea Dragon Group, and the Chinese-based organization known as the Red Door. He depicted a vivid image of how these groups had amassed substantial wealth through their intricate manipulations of the coin market. The outcome of these manipulations, Bam described, was the accumulation of immense riches by these groups that made their places in the world. Since that time, a new era had dawned, one where gangsters had firmly established their presence in the realm of cryptocurrency funds. Bayam's investigations had revealed that the influence of coin gangsters was not limited to a single region. Instead, they seemed to proliferate across the entire country. 
Armed with the knowledge of the widespread presence of coin gangsters and the extent of their influence, Bayam understood the importance of concealing his own past involvement in the cryptocurrency world. As Myung pointed the gun at Bayam, she sensed he had something intriguing to say. She decided to hear him out, her finger hovering near the trigger. Bayam couldn't hide his delight as he saw Myung fall right into his trap. Bayam's satisfaction grew as he observed Myung's eyes widen in response to his mention of a mysterious figure known as X. His emotional manipulation seemed to be working exactly as he had planned. As Bayam continued to talk about X and their shared interests, Myung began to feel a surprising connection with him. His dedication to this cause was genuine, and the mention of X was part of the evidence he had gathered, not just a manipulation tactic. X held the largest whale in the coin world, and the information Bayam possessed was not only intriguing, but potentially valuable in their pursuit to bring down the cryptocurrency scam. With just 500,001, X had managed to amass several billions in the cryptocurrency market. The scale of X's success was staggering. Bayam, strategically weaving a fabricated story about being one of X's victims. Though his tale was a lie, it was clear that his deception had successfully engaged Mi Young's empathy and curiosity. Bayam, aware of Mi Young's emotional attachment to her boyfriend, incorporated this key detail into his fabricated story about being a victim of X. His research had revealed that Mi Young's boyfriend had fallen victim to X, plunging them both into a significant debt. Her love for her boyfriend and the guilt she must have felt for forgiving him so quickly weighed heavily on her. As Bayam continued to spin his fabricated story, revealing the tragic outcome of Mi Young's boyfriend taking his own life due to the debt incurred from X's scams, Mi Young's emotions were deeply stirred. As Bayam wove his intricate web of deception and manipulation, he couldn't help but hope that his research was accurate. Bayam's successful manipulation had a profound effect on Mi Young. She had been deceived by his fabricated story and now saw him in a different light. She became unexpectedly kind and understanding towards Bayam, their interactions taking on a new, more cooperative tone. A self-satisfied smirk crept across Bayam's face as he observed the change in Myung's attitude. With a steely resolve, Bayam was determined to bring down those who had played a role in ruining his life, and Myung had unwittingly become a part of that mission. Bayam's discovery about Myung's involvement in the cryptocurrency scam that had led to his father's death was a shocking revelation. It added a deeply personal and vengeful layer to his determination to bring down those responsible. Bayam's anger and thirst for vengeance had reached a dangerous peak. Swearing to destroy Mi Young after using her for their mutual goals revealed the depth of his bitterness. After a few following days with his deal with Pilgu, as he reflected on the gravity of the situation he had willingly entered, he couldn't help but revisit the memories and experiences that had led him here. Time became a blurred concept for Bayam as he threw himself wholeheartedly into his work. Sleepless nights and tireless days were his new norm as he devised intricate strategies to squeeze every last bit of money from his unsuspecting victims within the one company. His dedication did not go unnoticed, and Bayam's colleagues began to regard him with newfound respect. One day, Myung entered the room and, to her surprise, found Bayam working with an intensity that bordered on obsession. She had expected him to be slacking off or concocting some scheme, but instead, he was fully immersed in his work. Despite her initial concern that Bayam might jeopardize their operation, Myung couldn't help but be intrigued by his unwavering commitment. Bayam explained to Myung that he was actively targeting potential victims in the coin market. Bayam hunted his victims by carefully analyzing the market charts and calculating potential targets based on their trading patterns and behaviors. Bayam's ability to read potential victims was honed by his traumatic experience with his gambling-addicted father, who had also become obsessed with coin. To execute his plan successfully, Bayam understood the importance of finding the perfect timing. This involved closely monitoring the cryptocurrency market and waiting for the ideal moment to implement his strategy. He was confident that his calculations were never wrong. Myung fell silent as she began to grasp the seriousness of his mission and the depth of his commitment to succeeding in the challenge set by Pilgu. As the deadline approached, he had not only recovered his initial investment, but had also tripled the amount from the 500,000 won he had started with. His strategy had proven successful, and he had achieved the impossible within the given time frame. Myung stared at Bam with a mixture of awe and fear in her heart. 
She had witnessed his incredible success in executing his strategy, and it left her both impressed and intimidated. This led her to a conclusion that she must stay away from Bam. In that moment, Mi Young realized that Bam was not just an ordinary newcomer to the world of coin. Bam's first plan to gain the trust of the company had finally succeeded, yet he maintained his nonchalant demeanor. Despite his impressive achievement, he didn't want to reveal too much of his true capabilities or intentions. Deep down, Bam couldn't find true happiness in his success. Before or he was acutely aware that his gains came at the expense of others. He understood that there were people out there who were grappling with the same obstacles and challenges he had faced in the past. Bam's colleagues were all celebrating thinking they should have an extravagant preparation. He watched as Mingu arrived with a cake in hand, and it only intensified his feelings of unease. To him, it was disheartening to witness people around him rejoicing over their achievements, all while knowing that their actions were contributing to the misery of others. The festivities around him only served as a stark reminder of the moral ambiguity of their work in the world of cryptocurrency scams. As Bayam observed his colleagues celebrating and laughing, he couldn't shake the feeling that these very same people might have laughed at him during his most challenging and depressing moments. This realization fueled an intense urge within him, a desire to somehow make them understand the pain and suffering that their actions inflicted on others. Jibong's silence hung heavily in the room, casting a shadow over the celebration. The festive atmosphere had been disrupted by Bayam's introspective and somber mood, and everyone could feel the tension in the air. Unable to bear the disgust and unease that had settled over the celebration, Bayam decided to make a quiet exit. As Bayam walked through the dimly lit corridors, lost in thought, he heard a voice calling his name. He turned to find Mi Young standing there. Mi Young, still puzzled by Bayam's demeanor, couldn't help but ask him why he appeared so disappointed despite successfully meeting Pilgu's challenge. She suggested that they should all celebrate, including Bayam, for his achievement. Bayam quickly made an excuse about having to attend a parents' meeting and excused himself from the situation. Mi Young was surprised, thinking that Bayam had a child, as his excuse about attending a parents' meeting caught her off guard. As Bam clarified that he was just taking on the role of a parent for his baby sister, Sung Ah, he didn't realize that he was being observed by Pilgu through hidden cameras. Pilgu had been closely monitoring Bam's activities in the One Company, especially as Bam's strategies had proven to be highly successful. Later that day at the Omais High School, Bam's day took a somber turn when he received news about his baby sister, Sung Ah. Her struggle with hearing impairment had made her the target of relentless bullies, the school staff were aware of the situation, but Sun Ah had chosen to suffer in silence, never speaking up about her torment. Bayam's heart sank as he learned about the cruelty his sister was enduring. Upon meeting with the teacher who was responsible for addressing such issues at Omei's high school, Bayam was advised to take on the role of a parent for his baby sister, Sun Ah. Bayam, who had already shouldered the responsibilities of a parent for Sung Ah in many aspects of their lives, Bayam asked the teacher for the names of the bullies who had been targeting Sung Ah on the other side of the school. The bullies who had been tormenting Sung Ah were engaged in their own fascination with the cryptocurrency craze. One of them had recently experienced a close call, almost losing a significant amount of money due to their involvement in a cryptocurrency scam. Sung Ah, a soft-spoken and innocent girl, happened to be in their vicinity. The bullies, lacking empathy and compassion, decided to target her for no reason other than the fact that she had sneezed. It was clear that they were looking for an outlet for their frustration and misery, and Sung Ah had become an unfortunate target for their cruelty. Out of nowhere, the bully slapped her across the face, using a derogatory slur to demean her further. Sung Ah, overwhelmed and hurt, stumbled backward and fell to the ground. Sung Ah, despite her fear and pain, continued to wear a brave smile on her face, refusing to let them see her tears. The bullies showed no signs of remorse. In fact, they appeared to relish in their cruelty. One of them reached for a sharp object. Their intentions were clear, and the atmosphere grew even more hostile and menacing. The bullies, consumed by their cruel intentions, could hardly contain their excitement at the prospect of tormenting Sung Ah. Little did these bullies know that Sung Ah had a protective older brother, Bayam, who was determined to put an end to their torment. The bullies didn't know that her older brother, Bayam, was on his way, ready to step in and protect his sister from any harm. Suddenly, Bayam appeared on the scene, his face a mask of simmering rage and determination. Bayam was not about to let anyone harm his sister. 
and the bullies were about to learn that the hard way. As Bam approached the bullies, they exchanged glances filled with mockery and underestimation. In their eyes, Bam was just another adult they could easily intimidate. In a swift and unexpected motion, Bam disarmed the bully who was brandishing a sharp object. The bullies were left in utter shock, their overconfidence shattered by the sudden display of Bam's combat skills. Despite seeing their friend defeated, Yoon Junbi and Kim Byungjin decided to take their chances against Bam. They were fueled by a mix of anger, pride, and a desire to regain control of the situation. Their overconfidence led them straight into Bam's trap. With swift and precise movements, Bam delivered a series of punch. Yoon Junbi was left in shock as he watched his friend, Kim Byungjin, lying defeated on the ground. With Kim Byungjin lying defeated and Yoon Junbi left as the sole aggressor, Bam wasted no time. He swiftly and decisively confronted Yoon Junbi, his eyes filled with determination and anger. With all three bullies incapacitated, Bam stood victorious, his heart pounding with adrenaline. As one of the bullies, fueled by anger and desperation due to his cryptocurrency debts, attempted to rise with a dangerous weapon. The defeated bully, filled with anger and a desire for revenge, made a silent vow to himself that he would find a way to get back at Bam. Bam couldn't help but wonder why his baby sister, Sung Ah, had ended up hanging out with such horrible people. However, the bully, consumed by anger and resentment, saw this as an opportunity to strike. In a sudden, brutal act, the bully lunged forward and thrust the weapon into Bam's back. The bully, fueled by rage and desperation, attempted to stab Bam repeatedly, each thrust of the weapon driven by a twisted desire to inflict harm. As the frantic struggle continued, the bully, in the midst of his violent assault, glanced down and was shocked to see Bam's torn and tattered clothes. On Bam's back, concealed beneath his torn clothes, was an intricate tapestry of gangster tattoos that told a story of his past. Sung Ah stood there, her eyes wide with shock and disbelief, as she witnessed her big brother's transformation. The realization hit the bully like a ton of bricks. The tattoo on Bayam's back, with its intricate Japanese design, was unmistakably associated with the criminal underworld. Bayam's anger simmered beneath the surface as he looked at the trembling bully. It wasn't just the physical threat that infuriated him. It was the realization that this young man had fallen victim to the same cryptocurrency scams that had destroyed his own family. In a voice filled with a mix of anger and concern, Bayam confronted the bully. As Bayam looked at the young man before him, he couldn't help but feel a deep sense of sorrow and empathy. He understood all too well the seductive nature of cryptocurrency and how it could quickly become an addiction. As Bayam witnessed the chaos and turmoil caused by the cryptocurrency craze, he couldn't help but reflect on how this digital phenomenon had the power to bring out the worst in people. Bam's hatred for the cryptocurrency system ran deep, and it pained him to see how even his sweet and innocent baby sister, Sung Ah, had been affected by its toxic influence. Trembling with fear in the end, facing Bam's fierce determination and his unexpected display of strength, the bullies had no choice but to apologize. The bullies, overwhelmed by fear and guilt, knelt before Sung Ah, tears in their eyes, and offered heartfelt apologies. Bam, still concerned for Sung Ah's safety and well-being, wanted to take her away from the troubling situation they had just faced with the bullies. As Bam prepared to leave with Sung Ah, he turned back to the repentant bully who had once been consumed by cryptocurrency addiction. Bam delivered an intimidating warning to the bully. He made it clear that the bully needed to delete all accounts related to coin, or else face the consequences. Meanwhile, at one company, Pilgu, the creator of One Company, listened intently as one of his team leaders approached him with a proposal to recruit Bam onto their team. It turns out, it was Myung who made a request to Pilgu. Myung likely recognized Bam's skills and potential contributions to the company's projects. Myung knew that Bam was a valuable asset to their mission, and she hoped that her request to recruit Bam onto the team would be approved. As Myung's request to recruit Bam onto the team was being discussed, one of the team leaders raised an objection. Steven, the team leader of Operation Team One, his objection stemmed from a desire to have Bayam's skills and expertise directly benefit his own operation. Myung couldn't hide her annoyance as her genuine discussion with Pilgu was interrupted by Steven's objection. Now, with Steven's objection, it seemed that their decision-making process was becoming more complicated and contentious. 
Stevens bragging about his team's wild and monstrous reputation from their gangster days, known as the Garbon Gambling, he believed that Bayham, with his skills and potential, deserved to be a part of a team that was known for its strength and aggressiveness. He believed that Bayham was better suited for a team with a strong and aggressive reputation, implying that Myung's team was weaker by comparison. Myung, triggered by Stevens' comments about the thug life, didn't hold back, she bluntly told Stephen that the thug life was outdated and that their focus should be on more sophisticated strategies. Pilgu, noticing Lee Jimin, the team leader of Operation Team 3, believed that Jimin's input could provide a fresh perspective on the matter. He considered Jimin's opinion to be valuable in making an informed decision regarding Bam's potential recruitment, but it appeared that Jimin was uninterested in joining the argument between Myung and Stephen, two formidable leaders. Stephen, not one to hold back, took the opportunity to tease Jimin for being a nerd despite his decision to stay out of the debate. Pilgu, fed up with the noise and disagreements among his team leaders, decided to take control of the situation. He clarified that he had always intended to transfer Bam to an operation team, regardless of the ongoing debate. Pilgu then revealed that he had arranged a daring test for Bam, indicating that this test would be the deciding factor in whether Bam would join one of the operation teams or not. Certainly, let's return to Bam and Sun Ah at the shopping mall. Bam bought Sun Ah some branded items that cost 2.83 million won. As the cashier explained the payment options, Bam casually placed a thick wad of cash on the table. Sun Ah's eyes widened in shock and disbelief as she watched her hardworking older brother produce such a substantial amount of money. The realization that Bayam had managed to purchase high-end brands like Gucci and Chanel for her left her overwhelmed. Walking along the sidewalk with her brother, Sung Ah couldn't contain her curiosity any longer. She patiently waited for Bayam to explain how he had come into possession of such a substantial amount of money. Bayam offered a simple and heartfelt explanation to his sister's inquiry. He told her that he had purchased the famous branded items for her as a way to prevent her from getting bullied or teased by her peers. Sung Ah's initial curiosity and appreciation quickly turned to frustration as she realized that her older brother couldn't provide a more substantial explanation for the source of the large sum of money. Feeling the weight of his sister's suspicion and anger, Bayam glanced back at Sung Ah as they walked, his eyes reflecting a mix of regret and concern. Hoping to ease his sister's suspicion and frustration, Bayam quickly came up with an excuse. He told Sung Ah that he had recently found a well-paying job, which explained his sudden ability to afford the expensive gifts. She yelled at Bayam, demanding to know which company he had applied to for this supposed well-paying job. Caught off guard, Bayam quickly looked around and spotted an advertisement poster on a passing bus. He pointed to it and told Sung Ah that he worked for the company featured on the poster. Sung Ah's frustration boiled over, and she couldn't contain her anger. Bayam was startled when Sung Ah, unable to contain her frustration and suspicion any longer, threw her shopping bags at him. As the realization of her brother's dishonesty sank in, Sung Ah could no longer hide her sadness and tears. Beneath the anger and disappointment, Sung Ah's pure heart longed for the closeness she once shared with her beloved big brother. Sung Ah confessed to Bayam that she didn't need expensive branded items, her words carried the weight of her sincerity, emphasizing that what she truly valued was her relationship with her big brother. Sung Ah's heartfelt desires were simple, but filled with nostalgia and love. She longed for the good old days when Bayam would patiently tutor her in school-related subjects, and they would enjoy late-night snacks together. Sung Ah's deepest wish was to be with Bayam because he was the only family she had. Bayam, despite his cold demeanor, felt a deep sympathy for his baby sister, for he understood her longing all too well deep down. He shared the same desire to return to their close-knit family life, but the weight of his revenge plan and the dangers it entailed left him with no choice but to distance himself from her. Bayam was acutely aware that there was no turning back from his path of revenge, as he firmly believed that it was the best course of action for both him and his sister. He believed that the situation he was embroiled in had two possible outcomes. Either the one company would succeed in destroying him, crushing his mission for revenge, or he would emerge as the force capable of dismantling the vicious corporate giant that had wreaked havoc on his life. As Bam and Sung Ah stood locked in a poignant moment, their emotions running high, the unexpected entrance of two deep-voiced men disrupted their intimate scene. 
The sudden intrusion brought a surge of tension and uncertainty. Bam and Sung Ah turned to face these newcomers, their expressions a mix of curiosity, caution, and wariness. As the two menacing men locked their gaze on Sung Ah, their ugly expressions sending a shiver down her spine, they made a chilling confession. They were bad guys. Panic gripped Bam at the realization that his baby sister might be in grave danger. He was torn between protecting her and the precarious situation unfolding before them. To make matters worse, just as Bam was trying to assess the threat to Sung Ah, he felt a presence behind him. A cold shiver ran down his spine as a man, concealed in the shadows, suddenly emerged, brandishing a knife. His soft yet menacingly deep voice cut through the tense atmosphere as he made a chilling demand for Bam's cooperation, hinting at dire consequences, particularly for Sung Ah, if Bam didn't comply. In the dimly lit construction site, Bam's world had taken a dark turn, bound and helpless in the center of the desolate location. Bam found himself tied up, his confusion growing as he tried to make sense of the situation. Amidst the tense atmosphere of the construction site, one of the thugs broke the silence and revealed their true motives. He confessed that they had been after Bam because he had unwittingly disrupted their operation plan, making it abundantly clear that these thugs were indeed rivals of the One Company. Bam's mind raced as he attempted to piece together the puzzle of his own involvement in the elaborate scheme and comprehend how it had affected these rival criminals. The leader, impatient and eager to get to the crux of the matter, delivered a chilling ultimatum. Bam was to return the money that their company had lost due to the crystal coin scam. Meanwhile, in a separate realm of the ongoing conflict, Pilgu had been meticulously conducting his own investigations. Truth had led him to crucial information about the Mindu side, responsible for orchestrating Bayam's capture. The Mindu side was a low-tier cryptocurrency operation, one that had suffered catastrophic losses directly attributable to the crystal coin scam. Recognizing the fragility of Bayam's situation, Pilgu made a calculated strategic move. He decided to leak selective information that implicated Bayam as the cunning mastermind behind the scam that had wreaked havoc upon the Mindu side. Myung found herself pondering the true intentions of Pilgu in his elaborate strategic plan. Pilgu had developed a unique metaphorical perspective on his role and relationship with Bayam in this metaphor. He likened himself to a lion and Bayam as his cub. Lions are known for pushing their cubs from the cliff shortly after birth. Only the strongest cubs, those capable of navigating the challenges of their environment, would survive this trial by fire. Kilgu's commitment to testing Bam in a harsh and demanding manner was unwavering, and he saw an opportunity to do just that when Bam was recently captured by the Mindu side. Pilgu's belief was clear and unwavering. It was either he died the next day, or Bam would remain committed and continue working in Pilgu's organization. The leader of the Mindu side was named Quan Mindu, a bald man with an unsightly appearance painted a vivid picture of this enigmatic figure. Quan Mindu couldn't help but feel a hint of disrespect as he observed Bam's nonchalant composure despite their current situation. In response to the unexpected challenge posed by Bam's nonchalant composure, Quan Mindu decided to call upon his second in command, Kim Kudong, as a former sushi chef. Kim was intimately familiar with the use of sharp knives, which had become his weapon of choice. Quan Mindu, determined to assert his authority and unnerve Bam, tightened his grip on Bam's arm. The vice-like hold was intended to send a clear message to instill fear. Bam suddenly became aware of the sharp knife pressed into his palm. Under the direction of Quan Mindu, Kim Kyudong began the interrogation, utilizing a unique and cryptic language of coins that only those within the Mindu side seemed to understand. Kim Kudong, with his sharp knife at the ready and his proficiency in the dark world of the Mindu side, Kudong began to put prices on each of Bam's limbs, suggesting that they intended to cut and sell them on the black market. Kim Kudong, in his twisted interrogation, made an outrageous and unfair offer to Bam. In order to secure his own survival, Bam was presented with the horrific choice of selling his body to the Mindu side. As the Mindu side continued their relentless efforts to intimidate and scare Bam, he began to notice something. It became increasingly apparent that this organization had conducted thorough research about him. Kim Kudong, despite Bam's attempts to ignore and resist their intimidation, maintained an unnerving composure. Kudong acted as if he was not bothered by Bam's stoic response. Bam decided to break his silence and address the Mindu side. With a calm and measured tone, he informed them that Pilgu had already taken care of the coin wallet. 
suggesting that their efforts to extract information or manipulate him were in vain. Kim Kyudong ordered Kwon Mindu to take a horrifying action, frustrated by Bam's resistance and the failure to extract the information they sought, Kyudong commanded Kwon to chop off Bam's fingers. It became evident that the Mindu side was not entirely unified in carrying out the gruesome act. Kwon Mindu, perhaps hesitant or conflicted, showed a moment of hesitation as he prepared to execute the command to chop off Bam's fingers. As Kwon Mindu hesitated and seemed to waver in his resolve to carry out the brutal act, Bayam's sharp instincts allowed him to see through the Mindu side's facade. Kwon Mindu, offended by Bayam's apparent lack of fear, drew his knife once again and aimed for Bayam's fingers, determined to carry out the gruesome act. However, to Bayam's surprise, Kwon's attempt seemed to falter, and he ultimately failed to execute the task. In that critical moment, Bayam had a realization. It became increasingly evident that the Mindu side's threats and intimidation tactics were, in fact, a bluff. As Bayam continued to assess the situation and the Mindu side's actions, he had realization. He understood that a relatively low-profile organization like the Mindu side would likely be hesitant to harm employees of a high-profile company like one. The Mindu side's awareness that harming Bayam would be tantamount to a declaration of war added a crucial dimension to the complex situation. The revelation that the Mindu side had targeted Bayam because they perceived him as a newbie, this miscalculation by the Mindu side highlighted Bayam's resourcefulness and ability to withstand their intimidation tactics. The Mindu side had hit rock bottom for two years and had been waiting for an opportunity to turn the tables by kidnapping a one employee shed light on their desperate circumstances and their willingness to resort to extreme measures. Crystal Coin, with its volatile and treacherous nature, Bayam's astute observation that the Mindu side had chosen to operate within the perilous world of Crystal Coin underscored the depths of their desperation. As the tension in the room escalated, and with Bayam's growing awareness of the Mindu side's desperation and vulnerability, Kwan Mindu seemed to recognize that Bayam had gleaned too much information. As Kim Kyudong faced the pressure to carry out the order to harm Bayam, he found himself torn between following through with the directive and the potential major consequences of his actions. Bayam revealed that he had conducted his own research about the Mindu side. His findings exposed the organization's involvement in pushing fake second-hand cars and exploiting vulnerable individuals, particularly older women, in their scams for 10 years. Bayam's conclusion that the Mindu side had never experienced killing anyone seemed to make Kim Kudong, in particular, nervous. The Mindu side's sudden defensiveness stemmed from their concern about appearing weak in the gangster industry. Despite being physically restrained and in a vulnerable position, Bayam exerted a dominant presence in the room. Kwan Mindu found himself at a loss for words, likely due to the body language and demeanor of Kim Kudong, who appeared conflicted. Bayam made a bold declaration. He asserted that, from that point forward, he would be the one in control, selling the lives of the Mindu side rather than the other way around. Bayam's strategic and declaration of dominance left everyone in the room immobilized and powerless. Bayam began to assert his authority and leverage his position as an engineer of the crystal coin. He made it clear that any attempt to harm him would have dire consequences for the Mindu side. In a daring and audacious move, Bayam expected them to pay him 100 million won per head, promising in return that he would pretend nothing had happened that day. Kwan's displeasure at being underestimated by Bayam was evident. But instead of relenting, Bayam continued to tease and taunt the Mindu side. He raised the price he demanded. Bayam's warning that each time they spoke back, he would raise the price added an element of control and manipulation to the negotiation. In a moment of frustration and desperation, Kwan Mindu reached his breaking point and grabbed the knife from Kim Kudong. Kwan's decision to take matters into his own hands, and with the knife in his possession and a determination to end the situation once and for all, he made the chilling choice to kill Bayam. As Kwan Mindu advanced toward Bayam with the intent to harm him, a sudden realization struck him, he couldn't touch Bam. In a new twist to their confrontation, Kwan Mindu decided to change his approach. Instead of directly engaging in violence, he opted to make it appear as if any harm that might fall Bam would be accidental. Kwan Mindu managed to inflict harm on Bam using the sharp knife he had seized earlier. Kwan Mindu's attempt to harm Bam took an unexpected twist. As Bam raised his knees in a defensive move, Kwan stumbled and tripped, losing his balance in the process. Kwan's embarrassing fall, which resulted in him landing on the ground, 
Bayam, slowly but steadily, began to regain his footing, now holding the upper hand once more. As Bayam assessed the situation and considered his options, he likely realized that escaping the predicament solely through bluffing his opponents was proving to be a challenging task. It appears that the Mindu side's lack of strategic acumen or a critical error in their approach may have presented an opportunity for Bayam to exploit their weaknesses. As the underlings from the Mindu side rushed toward Bayam, one of them keenly observed that something was not right. In a dramatic reversal of fortunes, Bayam managed to seize the upper hand in the confrontation by taking Quan Mindu captive with a knife pointed at Quan's head. The escalating situation prompted Quan had to call for assistance from a subordinate referred to as Red Hair. Bayam's order to Red Hair, instructing him to press the call button in the tower lift while directing the others to move back behind the wall, suggested a coordinated effort to change the dynamics of the situation. The confusion arising from the orders given by Bayam when Red Hair and his comrade, standing beside him, appeared to be misunderstanding. Red Hair, it seems, was not the one in charge of the tower lift. Red Hair's unease in response to unfamiliar orders persisted. Quan's sharp rebuke directed at Red Hair for hesitating underscored the urgency and high-stakes nature of the situation. After the intense situation, Bayam managed to seize an opportunity to escape through the tower lift. As the situation evolved, Bayam's escape left the remaining underlings tied up, while Quan took the initiative to make a call to his boss, likely to report the developments and inform them of Bayam's escape. Bayam's decision to entrust Red Hair, also known as Yongmin, with operating the tower lift because he was the youngest underlined Bayam's strategic thinking, Bayam likely believed that Yongmin would be less likely to take unnecessary actions or pose a threat while carrying out the task. Quan's realization that they had made a mistake by speaking openly while Bayam was in the room and likely overhearing everything highlighted the critical importance of discretion and careful communication in their line of work. The revelation that Quan's boss was none other than X, the mysterious coin user who had played a significant role in the lives of Miyoung. X's displeasure at being outsmarted by Bayam underscored the tension and rivalry between these two central characters. Bayam, severely wounded from his encounter with Quan, was hanging on to life by a thread. In a painful flashback, Bayam recalled the moment when Quan had attempted to stab him. At the time, he had underestimated the severity of the wound, believing it to be minor. Realizing the urgency of his condition, Bayam understood that he had to make a swift dash to the hospital for medical attention. As Bayam struggled to stay conscious while making his way to the hospital, he was recognized by a passerby on the street. The recognition by the passerby turned out to be a reunion with the girl from Bayam's college days, a person characterized by their kindness and sweetness. The revelation that the girl from Bayam's college days was named Young Salmon and now worked at the police department introduced an intriguing twist to the story. Bayam's recollection of Salmon as the kind and friendly person who had treated him kindly during their college days. Bayam's memory of Salmon where her willingness to connect with introverts during their college days likely contributed to the positive impression he had of her. Bayam's sudden dizziness and impaired vision marked a concerning development in his already precarious situation. Bayam's sudden collapse and loss of consciousness were alarming, emphasizing the gravity of his injuries. Salman's evident concern for Bayam in this critical moment added depth to their unexpected reunion. Bayam's awakening later that night, regaining consciousness and getting his senses back. Bayam's awakening in an unfamiliar location heightened the sense of disorientation and the need for immediate situational awareness. Bayam's realization that he was in Salmon's place and her presence as she checked up on his condition providing shelter and assistance to Bayam. Despite finding himself in Salmon's place, he understood the need to remain vigilant and assess the potential risks and consequences of his actions. Salmon's attempt to initiate a conversation by noting the changes in Bayam's demeanor and character indicated her desire to reconnect and engage with him on a personal level. Salmon remembered Bayam having a fluffy hair and only wore glasses throughout college that she almost didn't recognize him. Salmon's line of questioning, delving into personal matters like Bayam's decision to drop out of college, reflected her interest in understanding his life experiences and choices. Bayam's decision to leave in response to the personal nature of Salmon's questions, he might have felt uncomfortable delving into such personal matters, especially given the complexities of his life. It appeared that Bayam's caution and guarded nature took precedence, and he chose to distance himself from a potentially vulnerable or revealing interaction. 
Her intent to connect and engage with Bayam on a personal level might have inadvertently crossed boundaries or made him uncomfortable. Bayam's accidental reveal of his company card to Sanan, who was a police officer, added an unexpected twist to their encounter. The story continues at the one. Pilgu's congratulatory message to Bayam for surviving his encounter with the Mindu side reflected the acknowledgement of Bayam's resilience and resourcefulness within the challenging world of cryptocurrency intrigue. The fact that Bayam and Pilgu were having their first interaction after three years, with Bayam choosing to act obedient despite harboring resentment toward Pilgu. Bayam's sense of accomplishment in gaining Pilgu's trust through his hard work underscored his determination. Pilgu shared with him the keen interest and enthusiasm of his team leaders in recruiting Bayam for their respective teams within the organization. With a measured tone, Pilgu then posed a direct question to Bayam, inquiring whether he had any inclination or interest in aligning himself with a specific team. Pilgu's satisfaction with Bayam's unquestioning response to the prospect of joining a team was palpable. He had observed Bayam's obedience and recognized the potential it held. As Pilgu considered Bayam's capabilities and the unique qualities he brought to the table, he began to see the bigger picture. Pilgu's proposal took Bayam completely by surprise. The suggestion that he should step into a leadership role overseeing the three team leaders was not something Bayam had anticipated. Bayam found himself genuinely surprised by the overwhelming position that Pilgu had suggested for him. It was a role that carried significant responsibility and authority, one that he hadn't expected to be offered. For Pilgu, this decision to elevate Bayam to an upper-hand position was not made lightly. He had been harboring suspicions about the three team leaders that had led him to consider Bayam as a potential candidate. Pilgu had recently become increasingly aware of a concerning pattern within his organization. He had noticed that whenever he issued instructions to the three team leaders, information seemed to leak or be compromised. Pilgu arrived at a sobering conclusion based on the persistent leaks and compromises within his organization. He had come to suspect that there was a spy operating among the three team leaders. Pilgu faced a troubling dilemma in his quest. He couldn't be certain whether the infiltrator was an undercover law enforcement agent or someone hired by their rival company. Pilgu, burdened by the uncertainty of the spy's motives, placed his hope and trust in Bayam to address this pressing concern. It became clear that he saw in Bayam not only the potential for leadership, but also the capability to handle this delicate and concerning matter. Pilgu, recognizing the importance of Bayam's role in identifying and apprehending the spy within his organization, made a significant deal. He promised Bayam that once the spy was successfully caught, he would elevate Bayam to a team leader position. Bayam couldn't believe how smoothly his plans to take down the company were progressing. His unexpected elevation to a team leader position had granted him a level of authority and influence he had never anticipated. In the end, Bayam found himself embracing the ruthless determination required to take down the spy within their organization. His initial reluctance had given way to a steely resolve, fueled by a desire for justice and revenge. Later that day at the police department, the story continued within the confines of the intellectual crime team at the police department. Inside the bustling office of the intellectual crime team, a determined detective named Salman was engrossed in her investigation. Her focus had turned towards the one company, which was led by the enigmatic figure Pilgu. Salman's role in the story was further defined as she was revealed to be a lieutenant within the National Police Agency's intellectual crime team. Salman couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off about Bayam during the brief time he had spent at her home. Salman couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as she discovered a potential connection between Bayam and the One Company. Yet, she hoped that she was mistaken, that Bayam's involvement with the One Company was purely coincidental. As Salman was engrossed in her investigation, her colleague's voice broke through her concentration. She turned to see one of her fellow detectives calling her over. Salman's colleague expressed genuine concern for her well-being as he observed her being deeply engrossed in her investigation concerning the One Company. Salman's colleague held a different perspective on the case, believing that it might be unnecessary for her to dig deeper into the investigation, especially since the charges against Pilgu and the One Company appeared to be clear-cut. Salman's colleague, concerned about her well-being and recognizing the toll the investigation was taking on her, extended a kind gesture by inviting her to lunch. Despite her colleague's invitation to take a break, Salman's gut feeling persisted, nagging at her like a persistent itch. She couldn't shake the sense that something was deeply wrong with Pilgu and the One Company. 
Salman's determination burned bright within her. She couldn't simply cast aside the nagging doubts and gut feeling that something was amiss with the One Company and its enigmatic leader, Pilgu. Going back on Bayam's side of the story. Bayam couldn't shake the nagging thought that there might be a spy among the three team leaders at the One Company. Th High's concern had been festering in his mind ever since Pilgu had mentioned the possibility of a traitor within their ranks. Bayam couldn't help but remember Pilgu's words and the promise they had made. Bayam's disbelief lingered, even as he contemplated the significant opportunity that had been presented to him so sudden. Amid his disbelief, Bayam saw the offer from Pilgu as the perfect opportunity to gain the company's trust and ultimately achieve his goal of taking down Pilgu. The elevator door opened, and to Bayam's surprise, he found himself face to face with one of the team leaders. He quickly realized that the team leader was none other than Steven. As Bayam found himself in the elevator with Steven, it became apparent that Steven had been actively searching for him. Bayam soon learned that Pilgu had assigned Steven the task of bringing him along in an upcoming operation. As Bayam stood face to face with Steven in the elevator, he took the opportunity to analyze Steven's personality. According to his findings, Steven was the oldest member of the One Company, and he had joined during his gangster days. While Steven might not have been known for his intellectual prowess, he had a reputation as a skilled fighter. Considering Steven's long history with One in his background, this led Bam to believe that there was a smaller chance of Steven being the traitor who leaked information to external parties. Steven's invitation to join him in his flashy and fancy car marked the beginning of their mission together. Bayam's curiosity was piqued as he wondered why their mission required mild physical activities. Steven's adherence to an old-fashioned gangster approach added an interesting dynamic to their mission. His belief in traditional methods might clash with Bayam's more modern, analytical approach. Later that day at the club. With Steven's more carefree and social approach contrasting with Bayam's analytical and cautious demeanor, he attempted to lighten the mood by inviting Bayam to have some alcoholic drinks. Bayam's cautious and sharp demeanor in the face of Stephen's attempts at friendliness underscored his understanding of the high stakes and potentially dangerous nature of their mission. Bayam's concern about Stephen's ability to complete the mission, particularly when he appeared to be drinking heavily during the day, it reflected Bayam's awareness of the potential risks associated with their partnership. All of a sudden, the staff's message about the arrival of the person Stephen had been waiting for added an immediate sense of urgency to the situation. Bayam sensed that the mission was turning into a joke due to Stephen's skepticism and growing concerns about the situation. Stephen's shift in demeanor from a more relaxed or casual attitude to a serious one signaled a significant change in the mission's dynamics. Bayam's surprise at Stephen's ability to switch from appearing as a reckless drunk to being intimidating highlighted the complexity of Stephen's character. As the visitor entered the club, he exuded an air of casual nonchalance that contrasted sharply with the expectations of a typical business meeting. The visitor, introducing himself as B. Kuhn, vice chairman of Bitmain, who's also a prominent player in the cryptocurrency industry. Upon hearing B. Kuhn mention the organization he was associated with, Bayam couldn't help but feel a growing sense of nervousness. While Bayam was feeling increasingly nervous about the meeting with Beek, Hoon, Steven, on the other hand, appeared surprisingly calm and energetic. After Beek, Hoon's arrival, Steven appeared to make an effort to be friendly and cordial towards him. With the mood lightened up, Steven decided to get down to business and inquire about the certificate of commendation for Bitmain. Beek, Hoon then opened his laptop to review the data. He found that obtaining the Certificate of Commendation for Bitmain was possible, as long as he could convince his father, who held a significant influence in the organization. On the sidelines, Bayam couldn't shake the feeling that this business meeting was far too casual for the stakes involved. He had expected a more discreet and serious discussion. Bayam's sense of disgust intensified as he sat with Beek, Hoon, and Steven, both of whom he viewed as participants in a world of deception and scams. In the end, Bayam couldn't help but draw parallels between the victims of cryptocurrency scams and his late father, a connection that led him to believe that these victims shared some degree of responsibility for their own misfortune. Bayam couldn't stand being in the presence of these two individuals he considered morally reprehensible. He excused himself to visit the restroom, hoping to find some solace and distance from their company. B. Kuhn, in a rather disrespectful manner, threw a cigarette butt at Bayam as he walked past. This sudden action caught Bayam by surprise. B. Kuhn's arrogant behavior and his reliance on nepotism were becoming increasingly evident. 
B. Kuhn was growing increasingly agitated, feeling disrespected by Bayam's apparent indifference to his presence. B. Kuhn's suggestion that Bayam should use their booth instead of the bathroom made Stephen uncomfortable, finding it quite inappropriate. B. Kuhn made a deal with Bayam, suggesting that Bayam should do as he says, and suddenly came out as bisexual. He then promised that if Bayam peed in their booth, he would instantly give them the certificate of commendation. The intense atmosphere was suddenly interrupted when the service crew arrived with the food they had ordered. The food arrived, but B. Kuhn, in a display of arrogance, acted as though he had never ordered it. He dismissively claimed that the food wasn't his order, causing an awkward situation for everyone at the table. Stephen, annoyed by B. Kuhn's arrogance, came to the waiter's defense, while the waiter pointed out that there was a receipt as evidence of B. Kuhn's food order. B. Kuhn, frustrated and unable to maintain his composure, resorted to violent behavior and harassed the waiter, all while still denying that he had ordered any food. As B. Kuhn continued to physically assault the waiter, he also hurled a barrage of demeaning words and insults, degrading the waiter for his perceived lower social status. Bam was seething with anger but couldn't turn around, knowing that reacting in this situation might escalate things further. The helpless waiter crumbled to the ground, trying to protect himself from Beek Hoon's violent outburst. Beek Hoon, fueled by his arrogance and anger, showed no mercy as he continued to physically abuse the helpless waiter. He shoved the waiter's head down into the spilled food. Beek Hoon's laughter echoed in the room as he sadistically continued to shove the waiter's head into the spilled food. Even someone like Stephen, who was no stranger to the criminal underworld, was taken aback by Beek Hoon's ruthless actions. Bayam, on the other hand, was seething with anger, but he remained hesitant to confront Beek Hoon. Beek Hoon's disappointment grew as the waiter, overwhelmed by the brutality he had endured, vomited the food he had been forced to eat. Beek Hoon's cruelty knew no bounds as he continued to verbally berate and humiliate the waiter, attacking not only his actions, but also his social status and perceived weakness. Beek Hoon's arrogance knew no bounds as he flaunted his wealth and success, even suggesting that the waiter should look up to him as a role model. Beek Hoon's cruelty knew no limits as he continued to physically assault the helpless waiter, showing no mercy even after the waiter had already endured his previous abuse. In a disturbing turn of events, B. Kuhn ordered Bam to lock the door, effectively trapping them in the booth with the helpless waiter. B. Kuhn's violent assault on the waiter continued, with him now resorting to kicking the helpless victim. B. Kuhn's anger abruptly shifted towards Bam, who had remained calm and seemingly indifferent to his presence earlier. B. Kuhn then asked Stephen if he could express his anger towards Bam, which made Stephen uncomfortable. Stephen was speechless as if like he had just met the most horrible human being ever. Bayam confronted Beek Hoon with an unshakable demeanor, determined to stand up against the arrogant man. It was clear that Bayam was prepared to challenge Beek Hoon and make him face the consequences of his actions. Beek Hoon, for some reason, chose to forgive Bayam, perhaps seeing a reflection of his own self in Bayam's defiance. However, Beek Hoon's apparent forgiveness was just a ruse, and he suddenly launched a punch at Bayam. To B. Kuhn's astonishment, Bayam didn't even flinch despite the force of the punch he had just thrown. B. Kuhn was left dumbfounded, watching Bayam seemingly unfazed by his punch, and in a mocking tone, Bayam even tried to give points on every B. Kuhn's punch. Bayam maintained his calm composure as he generously awarded five points for B. Kuhn's effort, which only irritated B. Kuhn further. B. Kuhn's pride couldn't handle the fact that Bayam didn't crumble under his abuse, and he was deeply offended by Bam's apparent indifference to his efforts. Observing the situation, Stephen couldn't help but acknowledge Bam's inner strength and resilience, which he hadn't expected when they first met. Stephen, realizing Bam's unexpected physical prowess, began to see him in a different light. He now understood that Bam wasn't just a smart and cautious individual. He also possessed formidable combat skills. Impressed by Bayam's abilities, Stephen recognized the value of having someone like Bayam on his team. He saw the potential for Bayam to be a valuable asset in their future endeavors. B. Kuhn, on the other hand, was visibly exhausted from his failed attempt to intimidate Bayam with physical violence. His arrogance had led to his own physical exhaustion, while Bayam remained unruffled. Bayam, eager to move past the unpleasant encounter with B. Kuhn, decided to get down to business. He hoped that Beek Hoon would agree to publish their request and get this meeting over with. 
Bikun, true to his arrogant nature, flatly refused their request and even added an offensive gesture to emphasize his rejection. Despite being the instigator of the confrontation, Bik Hun had the audacity to report Bam and the organization to his powerful father, hoping to get them into trouble. Bam turned to Stephen, a subtle way of indicating that Bik Hun's rejection wouldn't deter their plans, almost as if he was mocking Bik Hun for his arrogance. Bik Hun began to realize that he might finally get a taste of his own medicine as Bam and Stephen remained determined despite his rejection. Stephen couldn't hide his satisfaction, knowing that Bi Kun might finally face the consequences he deserves for his arrogant and abusive behavior. As Bam locked the doors, Bi Kun was terrified knowing that karma is on the way. Bi Kun began to be nervous as he ordered Bam to unlock the doors, knowing that Bam will beat the crap out of him. Bam's punch landed squarely on Bi Kun's face. He was now dazed and disoriented, was completely unprepared for the retaliation he was facing. Bikun's arrogance had led him into a situation he couldn't control. He couldn't believe that Bam, the man he had tried to bully, was now overpowering him. Panic began to set in as Bikun struggled to regain his balance. Bikun, desperate to stop the beating, offered Bam a sum of 10,000 won in a futile attempt to buy his way out of the situation. Bam remained relentless, undeterred by Bikun's desperate offer. Bikun suddenly felt dizzy from all the punch. But Bam continued to deliver blows, determined to give Beak Hoon a taste of his own medicine for his abusive behavior. With a powerful kick, Bam sent Beak Hoon sprawling to the ground. The force behind the kick left Beak Hoon gasping for breath, struggling to regain his composure. Beak Hoon, still groaning in pain on the ground, managed to utter his threat, but it lacked the venom and confidence it once held. Beak Hoon tried to use his authority being the vice president of Bitmain, and that his father is the CEO which has the power to mess up the lives who crosses their line. Bam was unshaken by Beak Hoon's threats as he grabbed Beak Hoon's hair. Bam reminded Beak Hoon of his earlier words about how he had supposedly hustled his way to the top. Bam told Beak Hoon that if he wanted to get out of the beating situation, he should start hustling his way out of it. Beak Hoon found himself trapped in a nightmare of his own making. With fear in his eyes, he begged Bam not to kill him. But of course, Bam wanted to give Bi Kun a beating that he deserves. The next day, Bi Kun visited his father to tell him about the humiliating encounter with Bam. Bi Kun, with bruises covering his face, knelt before his father, appearing more like a vulnerable child seeking refuge. Bi Kun, in a desperate plea, begged his father to take action, but instead, his father yelled at him for being irritating. Bi Kun's father appeared preoccupied, engrossed in a game of mahjong. Bi Kun's father's opponent appeared visibly delighted, his eyes gleaming with anticipation, as he was on the verge of securing a victory against the CEO of Bitmain. In a shocking turn of events, Bi Kun's father, like his son, displayed a similar streak of being a sore loser as he abruptly cut off his opponent's winning finger. The CEO of Bitmain resorted to using his katana to ruthlessly slice off his opponent's finger, leaving the latter writhing in agony on the floor. The game of Mahjong took an unfair turn when the CEO of Bitmain's opponent was forced to lend his lucky card to the CEO, further tipping the odds in the CEO's favor. The CEO of Bitmain's underlings nervously applauded their boss, well aware of his maniacal tendencies and not wanting to upset him further. Beak Guai, the infamous CEO of Bitmain, notorious as the White Monster, was consumed by anger and disappointment as he witnessed his son, Beak Hoon, kneeling before him, his face covered in bruises. Meanwhile, at one company, Mi Young's face contorted with a mixture of worry and anger as she learned about Bam's confrontation with Beak Hoon, she couldn't help but think about the potential repercussions that could affect not only Bam, but also their entire operation. Mi Young's concern deepened as she thought about the potential consequences of Bam and Steven's actions, especially given their company's business dealings with Bitmain. Steven spoke up, suggesting that beating up someone wasn't a big deal. Mi Young, on the other hand, couldn't help but respond with a touch of sarcasm to beat up Steven as well. Amidst the heated argument between Mi Young and Steven, Bam remained a silent observer. As the chaos unfolded around him, Bam couldn't shake the persistent thought of the spy within the One Company. Bam couldn't help but consider all possibilities when it came to the spy within the One Company. Even Mi Young, who had been by his side, wasn't entirely exempt from his suspicion. 
As Bayam's mind raced through the potential suspects, he recalled a critical moment where Myung interrogated him at gunpoint served as a stark reminder that Myung's loyalty was unquestionable. Despite Bayam's sharp intellect, the identity of the spy among the three team leaders remained elusive. He knew that unraveling this mystery required careful observation. Jimin's sudden appearance interrupted the ongoing argument between Bayam, Myung, and Steven. Ray were taken aback, but quickly composed themselves, contemplating whether they knew of a nice restaurant in the area. Steven's irritation grew as Jimin appeared during their intense conversation, and he couldn't help but express his annoyance at the interruption. Jimin clarified that his question about a nice restaurant was related to a business matter, and he was genuinely seeking their input for a professional purpose. Bam couldn't help but notice that Jimin had a certain air of mystery around him, as he hadn't been able to find much information about Jimin in his research. Due to the lack of information available about Jimin, Bam had a growing suspicion that Jimin might be the spy among the team leaders at the One Company. All of a sudden, they exchanged glances filled with apprehension as they were called to Pilgu's office, their thoughts swirled with questions, suspicions, and a gnawing anxiety. Bam's keen perception picked up on the nuances in Pilgu's voice as he made the announcement, leading Bam to suspect that they were being closely monitored. Facing Pilgu, the four of them could sense his displeasure with the recent events. His stern expression and the subtle tension in the room made it clear that the situation was far from ideal. Pilgu, with a serious tone, revealed the pressing matter at hand. He explained that the CEO of Bitmain, Beek Gwai, had personally demanded the responsible party behind his son Beek Hoon's beating. Pilgu, his eyes stern and unwavering, he wanted to understand how a seemingly straightforward business meeting had escalated into such chaos and why their actions had drawn the attention of a formidable figure like Beek Gwai. Pilgu dropped a bombshell revelation. He disclosed that before Beek Gwai had entered the world of cryptocurrency and Bitmain, he had been a notorious gangster with a fearsome reputation as the White Monster. Pilgu continued to unveil more details about Beek Gwai's past, revealing that in his youth, Beek Gwai had competed with international mafias, solidifying his reputation as a ruthless and cunning figure. Pilgu couldn't help but express sympathy for anyone who dared to cross Beek Gwai's path. When he explained that those who had previously angered Beek Gwai had faced severe consequences, often involving torture and brutal methods. Pilgu shared a chilling detail he had heard about Beek Gwai, that the man was a peculiar collector of medieval torture devices, and that 9 out of 10 people who faced those devices did not survive. Pilgu stressed the urgency of resolving the situation, emphasizing that they had to find and hand over the person responsible for the attack on Beek Hoon. He feared that failing to do so would escalate into a full-blown conflict between their organization and Beek Gwai's. Pilgu didn't beat around the bush. He demanded that the person responsible for injuring Beek, whom to step forward and confess. Bam, without any hesitation, raised his hand and confessed to being responsible for the injuries inflicted on Beek Hoon. In a surprising turn of events, Stephen spoke up. His voice was resolute, and he took the blame upon himself, trying to shield Bam from the consequences. Bam tried to speak up again, insisting that he should be the one to take responsibility, but Stephen was firm in his decision. He believed that he should shoulder the blame and consequences for their actions. Stephen tried to act intimidating, emphasizing that as a senior member, he should be the one to handle the consequences of their actions. Bam was left speechless by Stephen's heroic act. Bam couldn't believe that a man working in a corrupt organization would show such courage. Bam couldn't discern whether Stephen was being genuine or just trying to act cool, especially given that he was part of a group that scammed and exploited others for their money. Pilgu questioned Stephen about whether he truly had the courage to face Beek Gwai's torture devices, and Stephen appeared resolute in standing by his words. Stephen was convinced that the situation would only escalate if he didn't step forward and admit responsibility. Bayam maintained a facade of indifference, secretly satisfied that his plan was unfolding as he had anticipated. With unwavering determination, Stephen recognized that there was no alternative but to confront the problem they had inadvertently created. As the tension in the room hung heavily in the air, Bayam, with a sense of determination in his voice, spoke up. He unveiled a surprising solution, and one that was unexpected yet carried the promise of escaping the dire situation they found themselves in. Bayam maintained a determined posture, his head held high, it was evident that he believed wholeheartedly in his plan and was confident in its potential effectiveness. 
Myung was taken aback when Baeum suddenly spoke up, revealing that he had a plan to take down Beak Gwai. Her surprise was evident, as she hadn't expected Baeum to come forward with such a bold proposal. Despite the anticipation in the room, Baeum chose not to reveal his plan just yet, displaying a sense of caution. Baeum remained hopeful that Pilgu would consider his request, while Pilgu responded with a challenging glare, making it clear that the decision was not going to be an easy one. Everyone in the room was taken aback when Baeum boldly suggested that he should lead the three team leaders in his operation to take down Beak Gwai. Myung couldn't help but have reservations about Baeum's proposal. She wondered if a newcomer like him could truly lead the three team leaders in such a daring operation. Baeum shot a determined glare back at Myung and challenged her by asking if she had any better plans to deal with the impending threat posed by Beak Gwai. Baeum turned back to Pilgu and questioned whether their organization would simply allow themselves to be crushed by Beak Gwai's wrath. Pilgu, recognizing Baeum's unwavering determination and convinced by the potential success of his plan, ultimately decided to invest in Baeum's strategy to confront Beak Gwai. Following the agreement, Pilgu granted Baeum's request, and all three team leaders agreed to follow Baeum's orders in their operation against Beak Gwai. Despite the decision, Myung continued to voice her objections and concerns regarding Baeum's leadership and the risky operation. Pilgu added a grim condition to the deal, making it clear that if Baeum failed in this operation, it would result in dire consequences for him. Baeum acknowledged the gravity of the situation and expressed his willingness to accept whatever consequences may come his way. Pilgu silenced Myung and instructed her to adhere to Baeum's plan, putting an end to any further objections. Bam assigned the three team leaders to handle the computer-related tasks in their operation. The three team leaders wore displeased expressions as they realized a newbie had taken the lead. Bam shot them a stern glare, silently conveying that if they had nothing to hide, they should simply follow his orders. A heavy silence fell over the room, the tension palpable as they all contemplated the mission ahead. Pilgu observed Bam carefully, recognizing that Bam was not only leading the operation, but also serving as a potential spy within their own organization. Pilgu realized that Bam had taken on the dual role of leading the operation and investigating the spy among the three team leaders. Pilgu was delighted to see such an efficient employee in his organization. Pilgu was curious to see just how far Bam's intellect and resourcefulness would take him in the operation to take down Beak Gwai and uncover the spy within their organization. Later that day, outside their company, Stephen, though initially hesitant about Bam taking the lead, felt a deep sense of gratitude towards him. He knew that Bam's plan had not only spared him from the wrath of Beak Gwai, but also offered a glimmer of hope in their precarious situation. Bam, always pragmatic and straightforward, wanted to clarify his intentions to Stephen. Bam's primary objective was not to save Stephen, but rather to achieve their mission. Stephen was genuinely surprised by Bam's willingness to step up and take charge of their operation. He couldn't help but dwell on it, as it went against the usual dynamics within their organization. In that moment, Stephen made a conscious decision to consider Bam as someone important in his life. Stephen's declaration of brotherhood hung in the air while Bam was being annoyed since his own motives and goals, and while their paths had temporarily aligned, he didn't want to be tied down by unnecessary attachments. Stephen's persistence in trying to create a friendship bond with Bam was admirable, while Bam may have initially rejected the idea of a sworn brotherhood. Despite Bam's initial reservations, Stephen's persistence eventually won him over. They decided to watch a movie together. Bam's decision to go along with Stephen because he had a hidden agenda he couldn't shake off the suspicion that one of the team leaders, including Steven, might be the spy in their organization. As they settled into the movie theater, Bam observed that Steven had a preference for comedy genre movies. Bam continued to observe Steven, and noticed that Steven had a rather unconventional taste in drinks, for instance, Steven liked adding cucumber to a mint chocolate frappuccino. As Bam continued to gather information about Steven, he discovered that Steven had a penchant for playing online games, particularly league games. During their time together, Steven shared anecdotes from his youth, including memories of a strict teacher named Mr. Kim who frequently caught him smoking. Bam listened carefully, trying to piece together any clues that might hint. As the day came to a close, Bam couldn't help but notice that Stephen consistently left to go home around 9 o'clock in the evening. He continued to gather these little details. Bam's mind was racing with thoughts, 
and he couldn't help but wonder if Stephen had noticed his suspicion. Bayam's surprise grew as he observed Stephen greeting a child. This unexpected encounter raised more questions in Bayam's mind. Bayam observed that the child Young Min didn't seem to like Stephen's presence due to his tobacco smell. Bayam was genuinely surprised to discover that Stephen was a father, a fact he hadn't expected. Bayam couldn't help but find it strange because during his research, he had come across information that indicated Stephen was unmarried. Bayam was filled with regret as he realized that he hadn't done enough research. Bayam was infuriated by the actions of Stephen and the harm that he was causing to other families. He couldn't understand how someone who was part of a family himself could be so heartless towards others. Bayam couldn't bear the sight of Stephen living a happy and contented life despite the pain and suffering that he had caused from exploiting people. As Bayam was walking away, Stephen called out his name. He stopped and turned towards Stephen. Stephen and his child, Young Min, were getting ready to leave and head home, but then he noticed Bam and figured that he should also join for dinner. As Bam arrived at Stephen's apartment for dinner, he could smell the delicious aroma of cooked chicken and tidiakbaki. But Bam couldn't help but feel like the meal wasn't entirely appropriate for a small family. The reason why Stephen had prepared such an elaborate meal was that it was Yong Min's favorite, however. Yong Min didn't seem to have much of an appetite. As Stephen invited young men to sit down and eat, the young boy slammed the door shut in defiance, leaving both Stephen and Bam taken aback. As Bam observed Stephen's interaction with young men, he couldn't help but notice the strained relationship between the father and son. It seems like Bam was curious about Stephen's marital status since they had been spending some time together. When Bam asked Stephen if he was married, Stephen clarified that he had never been married. Bam's curiosity seems to have shifted towards Stephen's role as a father figure to young men. Stephen's revelation clarifies the reason behind his role as a father figure to young men. It appears that young men is the son of a deceased colleague of Stephen's. Bam was shocked as Stephen's revelation about young men's parentage and the circumstances surrounding his role as a father figure would be unexpected and likely carry emotional weight. Stephen and Young Min's father had a close friendship dating back to the beginning of one, however. The twist is that Young Min's father was a police officer who was investigating scams committed by one. In a dramatic turn of events, it was revealed that Stephen had no choice but to take the life of Young Min's father. The situation takes an even more disturbing turn as it's revealed that Young Min witnessed Stephen killing his own biological father. Bam's reaction to the whole story, given the shocking and disturbing revelations about Stephen's involvement in the death of Yong Min's father and the traumatic experience that Yong Min had to witness. Stephen questioned Bam's surprise, noting that in their line of work, murder is not uncommon, especially when dealing with individuals who may be seen as threats or informants. Bam responded to Stephen with a daring glare, solidifying his suspicion that Stephen is indeed a morally questionable person. Bam experienced a sense of regret and self-criticism for briefly entertaining the idea that Stephen might be a good person. Witnessing Stephen's true nature shattered those positive thoughts, leaving Bam with a clearer understanding of the kind of person Stephen is. Upon Stephen's confession of murdering a man in the presence of a child, Bam's disgust reached a breaking point. Bam made the decision to leave. Despite the disturbing revelations and moral conflicts that have unfolded, Bam remained focused on their mission. He reminded Stephen that they needed to be prepared for the upcoming operation to take down Beak Gwai. Stephen expressed curiosity about Bam's plan to take down a professional mafia figure like Beak Gwai, however. Bam chose to keep the details of his plan, a secret preferring to surprise everyone. Bam's caution in not revealing the details of his plan to Stephen stems from a concern that their information could be leaked, particularly due to the suspicion that there might be a spy within one company. Stephen's curiosity continued to grow, but he recognized that Bam, as the leader of the three team leaders at one, had authority over the mission. The next day at Beak Gwai's house, the news spread among Beak Gwai's underlings that Bam had finally arrived. Beak Gwai, the president of Bitmain, sat on his throne with a clear intent to confront Bam. He ordered his underlings to allow Bam to enter, signaling that a confrontation was imminent. Bam entered the room dressed in formal attire, indicating his seriousness and respect for the situation. Beak Gwai's displeasure at seeing Bam, who had previously beaten up his son Beak, Hoon, was palpable. 
Despite Beak Gwai's notorious reputation for brutality, Bam remained resolute and unflinching as soon as Beak Gwai spoke. With a nonchalant aura, Bam introduced himself, displaying a calm and composed demeanor in the face of tension. From Beak Gwai's perspective, he couldn't help but admire the fact that Bam, despite being a newcomer in one, displayed remarkable courage and composure. Beak Hoon's reaction was unable to control his emotions, Beak Hoon resorted to childish behavior, loudly accusing Bam of being the one responsible for his bruises. Beak Gwai, who had a reputation for brutal methods, surprised those in the room by loudly admonishing his son. He emphasized that they should not resort to murder. Beak Gwai's confession that killing a human being was against his ideology further deepened the complexity of his character. But the truth is, Beak Gwai's possession of a medieval torture device called the Iron Maiden, which he used to force victims inside against their will, painted a darker and more sinister picture of his character. The act of opening the Iron Maiden, revealing numerous bloodstains within the device, indicated that the torture device had been used extensively in the past to inflict pain and suffering on victims. The presence of the foul smell of rotten blood was evidently overpowering, even for those who had been working under Beak Gwai for a long time. Beak Gwai's sinister demeanor, coupled with his apparent enjoyment of the image of suffering rather than a quick death, painted a truly disturbing picture. Despite Beak Gwai's terrifying proposal for Bayam's punishment and his sadistic tendencies, Bayam continued to display remarkable composure and an unwavering lack of intimidation. Beak Gwai's internal turmoil revealed that he couldn't believe how much more intimidated he felt in the face of Bayam's nonchalant response to his threat, leaving him deeply unsettled by Bayam's unyielding demeanor. Unsatisfied with Bayam's response and determined to take matters into his own hands, Beak Gwai drew his katana, signaling his intent to confront Bayam personally. Beak Hoon, unable to contain his emotions any longer, spoke up. He expressed his frustration and feelings of disrespect, especially because Bayam didn't appear to be intimidated by his own ruthless father. With a smirk on his face, Bayam revealed that his presence in Beak Gwai's house was not to face brutal punishment, but rather to discuss a business proposal. Beak Hoon's feelings of confusion and discomfort towards Bayam were understandable, as the invitation from the Bitmain organization was initially for punishment rather than a business conversation. Bayam's satisfaction, driven by his confidence in his ability to take down one of the most ruthless organizations, reflected his determination and strategic mindset. Beak Gwai's shock extended beyond Bayam's lack of fear. It stemmed from the realization that Bayam had meticulously prepared himself before confronting a terrible and deadly organization like Bitmain. Bayam's preparedness took a tangible form as he presented a dataset containing cryptocurrency analytics, specifically focusing on stable coins, a type of cryptocurrency whose value is pegged to another asset class. This data likely represented a critical component of his business proposal, further emphasizing his thorough planning and strategic approach to the meeting. Beak Hoon's shock deepened as he observed Bayam's determination to push forward with his proposal rather than apologizing for his previous actions. The atmosphere in the room grew increasingly heavy as Bayam disclosed that Bitmain had been involved in scams that had led to the unbearably high value of their cryptocurrency. In a recent meeting, Bayam finally revealed to Stephen how he planned to take down Beak Gwai, the head of Bitmain. Bayam's revelation that he didn't plan on taking down Beak Gwai himself would have likely come as a surprise to Stephen and significantly altered their mission's direction. But rather, he intended to take down the entire Bitmain organization, rather than just targeting Beak Gwai himself, would have been a major revelation with significant implications. Myung's shock at Bayam's real intention to take down the entire coin exchange led by Beak Gwai, one of the largest businesses in the cryptocurrency industry, where Bayam's plan would likely pose numerous challenges and dangers. Bayam's awareness of Bitmain's status as one of the major players in the cryptocurrency business would have factored into his decision to target the entire organization. Bayam's revelation of his research about the Bitmain organization to the three team leaders marked a crucial step in their mission. The information that Bitmain was involved in money laundering by foreign criminal organizations added a significant layer of complexity to their mission. Due to Bitmain's system, they had coined the term main coin. This suggests that Bitmain had a significant influence in shaping the cryptocurrency industry, particularly in terms of their own proprietary digital currency. 
Myung's understanding that once the information about Bitmain's illegal activities was released, it would lead to a major scandal is a significant realization. Bayham's revealed that the Bitmain might appear to have a smooth money laundering operation is a critical insight. It suggests that Bitmain's criminal activities may be well concealed and not easily detectable on the surface. But in reality, upon closer examination, actually quite disorganized and messy. It implied that while Bitmain might present a facade of smooth operation, it had vulnerabilities and weaknesses that could be exploited. The information that Beek Gwai had been scamming his foreign business gang partners, this knowledge would likely have significant implications for their mission, as it could create internal strife and conflicts within Bitmain's network of criminal organizations. Beek Gwai's notoriety as the White Monster, a vicious thug in his past, explained why he was trusted by his foreign business partners. His intimidating reputation and criminal background likely gave him a unique advantage in the criminal underworld. Bayham's mastery of Bitmain's pattern, where they used main coin as collateral to gain more leverage for their growth, was a significant breakthrough. Understanding this pattern would be crucial in formulating an effective strategy to disrupt Bitmain's operations. Stevens' understanding that once all the information Bayham had gathered was leaked, it would lead to Bitmain's foreign partners cutting ties with the organization, potentially leading to its downfall, was a crucial realization. Given the potential impact of the information Bayham had gathered on Bitmain's operations and its network of foreign partners, Bayham concluded that using this information would be the most effective way to exploit Beek Gwai's weakness. Going back to Beek Gwai and Bayham's fight, Bayham revealed his intention to expose Bitmain's secrets to their foreign partners to Beek Gwai, as it directly threatened the organization's stability and Beek Gwai's control over it. But Beek Gwai's lack of fear and his daring challenge to Bayham to expose Bitmain's secrets showed his confidence and resolve in the face of the impending threat. Bayham's extensive research and knowledge about Bitmain earned him Beek Gwai's respect. Despite the threat to expose the organization's secrets, Beek Gwai's lack of fear in the face of Bayham's threats showcased his confidence. Beek Gwai's awareness that attempts to take down each other's organizations were common in their industry. The acknowledgement of the industry's ruthless nature further emphasized the complexity and high stakes of their conflict. Beek Gwai's reminder to Bam that their business partners were foreign gangsters served as a cautionary note. Beek Gwai appeared to believe that Bam didn't have any knowledge of the contact numbers of Bitmain's foreign business partners. This assumption might have stemmed from the confidence that his organization's secrets were well guarded. Beek Gwai's wonderment about how Bam could possibly contact Bitmain's well guarded business partners indicated his skepticism regarding Bam's capabilities. With full confidence in his position, Beek Gwai yielded his katana, believing that Bayam had not conducted a thorough enough research to locate Bitmain's business partners. He likely viewed the information as highly protected and believed that Bayam would face insurmountable obstacles in reaching out to the foreign gang partners. Bayam's words likely shattered Beek Gwai's confidence as he realized that Bayam had indeed managed to gather enough information to contact Bitmain's business partners. Bam's presentation of a data file containing addresses of Bitmain's foreign business partners would have been a shocking and powerful moment in their confrontation. Beek Gwai's tight grip on his katana in response to Bam's revelation that he had made reservations to meet with Bitmain's business partners demonstrated his escalating concern and desperation. Beek Gwai's realization that Bam was serious and not joking around would have been a sobering moment for him. Beek Gwai's sense of betrayal upon realizing that their confidential information about Bitmain's organization had been leaked would have been a deeply unsettling and infuriating realization. Bam's revelation that they had obtained the information from Beek Hoon, Beek Gwai's own son, would have been a stunning and deeply shocking moment in their confrontation. Bam's revelation that they had obtained all the information from Beek Hoon's laptop would have been a precise and incriminating detail. Beek Gwai's disbelief that the downfall of their organization was, in essence, caused by his own son, the fact that his own flesh and blood had played a key role in exposing Bitmain's secrets. Beek Hoon's realization that the information had been leaked while he was being beaten up by Bam suggests that he may not have intentionally betrayed his father. Instead, it appears that he may have been caught up in the situation and unaware. While the confrontation between Bam and Beek Gwai unfolded, the three team leaders were likely listening intently to the entire exchange. 
in the same room, Myung's curiosity about how Bayam managed to obtain the information from Beek, Hoon's laptop. Meanwhile, Stephen appeared to have some understanding of Bayam's methods. Stephen proceeded to explain to Myung the events that occurred when he and Bayam confronted Beek Hoon. Stephen's explanation that Beek Hoon's arrogant behavior had led to him being beaten up by Bayam provided insight into the circumstances surrounding the extraction of information from Beek Hoon's laptop. The severity of Beek Hoon's beating, to the point where he passed out, underscored the intensity and brutality of the confrontation between him and Bayam. Stephen's surprise at Bayam's ability to smile despite having harmed the vice president of Bitmain, his demeanor might have been a result of his determination and confidence in their plan. Bayam's decision to take advantage of the opportunity presented when Bee Kuhn passed out and check his laptop demonstrated his strategic thinking and commitment to the mission. Bayam's calculated decision to use the two-hour window while Bee Kuhn was unconscious to access his laptop and copy all the data. Stephen's conclusion that this was how Bayam managed to obtain information from all of Bitmain's foreign business partners would have provided clarity on the method they used to gather crucial data. Myung and Stephen experiencing goosebumps due to Bayam's unwavering composure and lack of panic in high-stress situations underscored Bayam's exceptional resilience and determination. Stephen's contemplation about whether Bayam's actions towards Beek, who were driven by morality or solely motivated by business. Myung felt a deep sense of terror as she observed Bayam's inhumane actions. It was unsettling to witness how far he was willing to go for their mission. In Stephen's view, he believed that beneath Bayam's nonchalant exterior, there were still underlying emotions and principles guiding his actions. Stephen couldn't shake the feeling that Bayam was hiding intense and overwhelming emotions beneath his nonchalant demeanor. Due to Bayam's recent performance and demeanor, Stephen harbored the belief that they should be cautious and not underestimate Bayam. But still, Myung felt a sense of gratitude because of Bayam's sharp wits and intellect, which had allowed them to outsmart one of the most ruthless cryptocurrency organizations. But then, Stephen's revelation that they never actually found any information in Beek, Hoon's computer added an unexpected twist to their mission. The revelation that what Bayam had shown earlier was actually fake. This development implied that Bayam had used deception as a strategic tactic in their mission leaving questions about his true motivations and methods. Despite presenting fake data and manipulating Beek Gwai, Bayam maintained his confidence and composure throughout the situation. Despite their experience in the cryptocurrency industry, nobody in the room had realized the deception yet. They were all overwhelmed by Bayam's charisma and the way he had handled the situation. Stephen recalled Bayam's explanation of the main concept behind their operation, which involved a seemingly fearless entry by a newcomer like Bayam into Beek Kwai's house. The strategy was designed to create illusion that Bayam had some hidden advantage keeping Bitmain's organization on edge and uncertain about their true intentions. Myung and Stephen both recognized the inherent risks in Bayam's plan, the high-stakes nature of their mission, as well as Bayam's use of deception and manipulation. Stephen came to the realization that one of the reasons Bam's plan was working so effectively was because he had been consistently underestimated since in the views of others, he's just a newbie. Myung found herself utterly speechless as she realized the immense level of confidence that Bam possessed. In the end, everyone in the room was left utterly flabbergasted by the revelation that Bam had been scamming the scammers. B. Kuhn's panic set in as he realized that Bam had definitively gained control over their organization, this moment marked a significant shift in the power dynamics within Bitmain. Beek Gwai's realization that his own son had brought him misfortune as he dropped his katana in a sign of defeat underscored the gravity of the situation and the turmoil within Bitmain's leadership. With no other apparent way to secure victory, Beek Gwai made the decision to negotiate with Bam. Beek Hoon likely felt a profound sense of betrayal when his father, Beek Gwai, apologized for his son's behavior as it implied that his father was prioritizing their organization's survival over his loyalty to his own son. The team leaders collectively felt a sense of relief as they witnessed their plan unfolding successfully. Just as it seemed that Bam might be exiting the tense scenario, he appeared to be considering the opportunity to gain even more from the situation. With a daring glare and a bold demand, Bam asserted that three of one's coins must be published within Bitmain, this demand signaled his intent to capitalize on their current advantage and expand their influence within Bitmain's operations. Myung and Steven were taken aback by Bam's business-oriented mindset and strategic approach. 
His ability to seamlessly switch between tactics and objectives, from manipulation to negotiation and business decisions, left them astonished. Beek Gwai, in response to Bayam's demand, reminded him that publishing a coin is a complex and challenging undertaking. In response to Beek Gwai's reminder, Bayam countered by emphasizing the potential consequences of leaking Bitmain's secrets. He pointed out that it wouldn't be easy for Bitmain's business to survive if their confidential information were exposed. Ultimately, Beek Gwai chose to set aside his pride in the face of the complex and high-stakes negotiations. Beek Gwai, after setting aside his pride, instructed his underlings to provide him with a stamp and a brush to draft a contract for Bam. The contract would likely outline the terms and conditions of their arrangement, solidifying their negotiated deal. To formalize the contract, Bayam hoped that Beek Gwai would place his stamp on the bottom part of the document. As Beek Gwai prepared the papers for the contract, he couldn't help but be amazed by how thoroughly Bayam had prepared for every aspect of their negotiation. Despite having reached an agreement, the passage of time felt slow as Beek Gwai carefully pulled out his stamp. Bayam couldn't help but reflect on the fact that he had just confronted one of the most notorious cryptocurrency organizations in the industry. Bayam's imagination likening a person in the cryptocurrency field to a time bomb, with the potential to grow bigger and more explosive over time, underscored the volatile and rapidly changing nature of the industry. Bayam's metaphorical portrayal of the bomb, unstoppable until it explodes in front of those who created it, carried a sense of inevitability and justice. Returning to reality, Bayam provided guidance to Beek Gwai about the specific spot where he should place his stamp on the contract. Beek Gwai, after careful consideration and negotiation, made the decision to wholeheartedly stamp the contract. With the contract stamped and their agreement formalized, it marked the conclusion of their negotiations. Unexpectedly, Beek Gwai had a change of heart. Beek Gwai had an abrupt change of heart and chose not to finalize the contract, creating a sudden and unexpected turn of events in their negotiations. Bayam found himself taken aback by this unexpected change in circumstances, especially when he had thought they were on the verge of concluding the situation. Beek Gwai revealed that he had recently received a text message from an anonymous sender, where it will leave both parties uncertain about its implications and the potential impact on their arrangement. The text message exposed Bayam by revealing that the information he had presented earlier was actually fake. Bayam had a realization about who might be the culprit behind, exposing him to beat Gwai. This sudden revelation likely sparked suspicions and prompted him to reconsider the motives and loyalties of those involved in their mission. It became evident to Bayam that the most likely culprit behind, exposing him to beat Gwai, was the spy among the three team leaders of one, who was currently assisting him in the operation. Despite the disadvantageous scenario and the revelation of the spy within their team, Bayam continued to handle the situation with confidence. Surprisingly, Bayam had another trick up his sleeve as Beek Gwai froze. Bayam played a recorded audio of Beek Gwai speaking ill of his foreign business partners. Bayam revealed that he had been recording the entire operation, further demonstrating his preparedness and strategic thinking. In a bold move, Bayam threatened Beek Gwai that he would undoubtedly leak the recorded audio of Beek Gwai's disparaging remarks to his foreign partners. Just when Beek Gwai believed he was gaining the upper hand in the confrontation, Bam once again left him utterly flabbergasted. While Beek Hoon couldn't contain his anger towards Bam, Beek Gwai chose not to involve his son in the confrontation any further. What angered Beek Gwai the most was Bam's apparent admission that the information he had presented earlier was fake, which could potentially put Bam in a precarious position. In a drastic turn of events, Beek Gwai made the grim decision to kill Bam and take possession of his recordings, believing it would resolve all of Bitmain's problems. Beek Hoon, despite the family dynamics and tensions, couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction that the person who had beaten him up would finally face the consequences of his actions through Beek Gwai's decision to kill Bam. Undoubtedly, Bam maintained his confidence and steadfastly justified that the information he had presented earlier was indeed real. With unwavering confidence, Bayam presented his data once more, reaffirming the validity of the information he had previously shared. Beek Gwai found himself speechless once again, as he had believed that all the information presented by Bayam was legitimate. On the other side of the operation, the team leaders were shocked to see that the information presented by Bayam appeared believably real, even though they were aware that it was, in fact, fake. Jimin, who had remained quiet throughout the ordeal, 
couldn't contain his astonishment at the turn of events. Returning to Bam and Beak Gwai's confrontation, the two of them locked eyes in a tense and heated glare. Beak Gwai seemed to reach a breaking point as he was outsmarted multiple times. He started laughing hysterically, a reaction that might have reflected a mix of disbelief, frustration, and perhaps even a touch of madness. In response to Beak Gwai's hysterical laughter, Bayam could only give him a look of confusion. Suddenly, Bayam found himself surrounded by Beak Gwai's underlings, a development that added an immediate and heightened sense of danger to the situation. At that point, Beak Gwai seemed to have abandoned all concern for the future. His actions and decisions reflected a sense of recklessness or desperation. Beak Gwai's desire for revenge seemed to be the driving force behind his actions, as he was determined to retaliate against Bam for making him appear foolish throughout their confrontation. In his reckless pursuit of a resolution, Beak Gwai made a dangerous move by believing that he could force Bam to stop his blackmailing through torture. Despite the chaotic and desperate actions of Beak Gwai, Bam maintained his composure. In a sudden and violent turn of events, one of Beak Gwai's underlings appeared behind Bam and attempted to strike him on the skull with a bat. In a chaotic and frenzied turn of events, multiple underlings from Beak Gwai's group rushed forward to attack Bam. Utilizing his physical combat skills, Bam managed to counterattack the oncoming underlings. The remaining underlings were left in shock as they witnessed their fellow subordinates getting knocked out with just a single hit from Bam. On the other hand, as Stephen listened to the chaos unfolding in Bayam's situation, Stephen grew increasingly concerned. To ease Stephen's concern, Bayam reassured him that he would handle the situation. Despite Bayam's reassurances, Stephen remained uneasy with the concept of Bayam risking his life in the operation. Bayam's primary focus was on ensuring the plan's success. He ordered the team leaders to proceed with Plan B, emphasizing the importance of executing the mission as originally intended. Stephen finally grasped Bam's intentions in the operation and chose to follow the orders to execute Plan B. On Bam's side, the underlings were likely feeling disrespected and frustrated because Bam's calm demeanor and lack of fear did not give them the satisfaction of intimidating their target. Suddenly, the lights in Beak Gwai's house went out, plunging the surroundings into darkness. The sudden loss of light left everyone involved in the confrontation shocked and inconvenienced. The sudden loss of lights turned out to be a deliberate part of Bayam's plan. As the darkness enveloped them, Bayam seized the moment to make his move. With a strategic advantage in the absence of light, he likely had a plan to navigate the situation and achieve his objectives. One of the underlings in the room improvised by using a lighter to create some light in the darkness. With the limited light available, the underlings checked on Beak Gwai to ensure his well-being. The confusion deepened as Beak Gwai began to speak about some of his belongings being missing. It was revealed that Plan B had a contingency built into it. Bayam's task was to steal the contracts, papers, and stamp if everything didn't go according to their initial plan. The revelation of Bayam's strategy left everyone involved in the confrontation utterly astonished. Beak Gwai, in a state of panic and frustration, began shouting orders at his underlings, urging them to catch Bam if he was spotted to prevent the contract from going public. Beak Gwai's underlings immediately sprang into action, conducting a thorough search of his house in a frantic hunt for Bam and the missing contract, papers, and stamp. In a daring move, Bam managed to hide in plain sight amidst the chaos of the search. Despite his resourcefulness, Bam found himself in a challenging situation as a blockade was set up in Beak Gwai's house, making it difficult for him to escape. Bam's heart sank as he felt a chill run down his spine, realizing that one of Beak Gwai's underlings had discovered him. With lightning-fast reflexes, Bam managed to dodge the sharp katana being swung at him by the underling. The commotion caused by Bam's dodge drew the attention of nearby underlings, who followed the noise to the location where Bam had been found. The underlings gathered around Bam, their actions motivated by a desire to impress their ruthless boss, Beak Gwai. As the underlings prepared to attack Bam, he remained calm and calculated, assessing his options to make an accurate defense. Bam's skilled combat style served him well, allowing him to counterattack effectively even when being attacked from his blind spot. His expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat and quick reflexes gave him the upper hand, further intensifying the confrontation as he fought back against the underlings. Despite being attacked by multiple underlings simultaneously, Bayam remained composed and at ease. 
His ability to handle multiple opponents with skill and confidence added to the tension of the confrontation. Bam's fearless determination was on full display as he fought his opponents with his bare hands, even when they wielded sharp objects. The chaos in the confrontation showed no signs of stopping as more of Beak Gwai's underlings arrived at the scene. The escalating number of opponents added to the intensity and danger of the situation. Just when Bam believed he could handle the outnumbered opponents, a sudden punch to the gut caught him off guard. The underling who delivered the unexpected punch to Bam's gut appeared to be the strongest among Beak Gwai's underlings. The underlings celebrated their apparent victory as they witnessed Bam being defeated. The underling who managed to make Bam stumble to the ground was the foreign lil giant, a formidable fighter known for his size and strength. His presence further underscored the challenge Bam faced in the confrontation as he struggled against this imposing opponent. Bam recognized Lil Giant as one of Beak Gwai's foreign mercenaries. He knew that Lil Giant, an American with aspirations of becoming a rapper, had fled to Korea after killing someone in America. Bam's realization that he was facing a dangerous and deadly opponent in the form of Lil Giant filled him with a sense of misfortune. As Lil Giant prepared to launch his attack, Bam couldn't help but feel a sense of nervousness. Just when it seemed like Bam was in dire straits facing Lil Giant, someone managed to swoop in and counterattack, saving Bam's life. The other underlings were left in astonishment as they witnessed their strongest subordinate, Lil Giant, crumple to the ground with just one hit. Even Bam found himself shocked that someone had come to his rescue. The identity of Bam's savior was none other than Steven, who had arrived at the scene to intervene in the confrontation. Despite Steven's courage and willingness to intervene, Bam was hesitant to involve anyone else in his fight. Steven, concerned for Bam's safety and determined to support his friend, didn't like the idea of Bam being defeated. Steven's reference to himself and Bam as sworn brothers signified a deep and unbreakable bond between them. Bam was likely taken aback by the fact that someone was not only willing to help him, but also had the ability to make a significant impact in the confrontation. Just when it seemed like the situation was beginning to ease, Lil Giant managed to get back on his knees and appeared ready to continue the fight. Steven's intention was for Bam to focus on retrieving the contracts, while he likely intended to take care of the remaining threats and underlings, his hope may have been that Bam would follow his lead and work together to secure their objectives in the confrontation. Suddenly, Lil Giant attempted to sneak up behind Steven with the intention of launching an attack. Lil Giant's viciousness and murderous intent likely made the situation even more perilous and raised the stakes of the confrontation. It appears that Lil Giant was unaware that he had encountered someone who could match his strength and combat skills. It seems that Steven, despite being known as the best fighter, was also a formidable combatant and his skills were on par with Lil Giant's. In a stunning turn of events, Steven unleashed a single punch that sent Lil Giant flying. It was indeed a surprising turn of events for Bam to find himself relying on someone like Steven, especially considering their shared history as scammers who had harmed others, a fact that Bam hated. In that pivotal moment, Steven and Bam joined forces, setting aside their past differences and motivations for a common purpose. With their combined skills and determination, Steven and Bam dominated the fight against Beak Gwai's underlings, including the formidable Lil Giant. The next day at 1, Bam successfully escaped from Beak Gwai's territory, bringing with him the stolen contracts and stamps. Bitmain and One resumed their negotiation, with Bam and his team holding the upper hand due to the stolen contracts and the threat of exposing Bitmain's illegal activities. Indeed, Bam's possession of the evidence and his ability to expose Bitmain's illegal activities gave him significant leverage in the negotiations. Beak Gwai had no other viable option but to surrender and accept the terms set by One. After the successful negotiation and surrender of Bitmain, three coins from the One organization were indeed published, marking a significant shift in the cryptocurrency market. As the One company gained more power and influence in the cryptocurrency industry, it became increasingly attractive to potential victims for their scamming schemes. Bam couldn't help but notice the substantial increase in capital gain for their company as he closely monitored their analytics. As Bam observed the consequences of their actions, he couldn't deny the fact that the one company had accumulated a significant number of victims whose lives had been severely impacted. Bam's past experiences as a victim of the cryptocurrency industry weighed heavily on him as he watched the number of victims increase due to their own organization's actions.
The next day, Bam was determined to uncover the identity of the spy within one. By eliminating the spy, Bam could prove his loyalty and dedication to the organization, earning Pilgu's confidence and cooperation in the process. It was a crucial step in his plan to dismantle one. Bam was fueled by a deep sense of anger and betrayal, since the spy's actions endangered Bam's life during the operation at Beak Gwai's house. Bam's sharp instincts kicked in as he overheard Stephen disclosing to the other team leaders that the information Bam had presented was fake, and some team members quickly alerted Beak Gwai about the false information only deepened Bam's suspicion that the spy might be closer than he thought. Bam, far from being foolish, had taken precautionary measures to safeguard his own interests. He had secretly planted a hidden camera during their operation within the team leader's side. Bam couldn't contain his excitement as he contemplated reviewing the footage from the hidden camera. With a sense of urgency and frustration, Bam quickly downloaded the footage from the hidden camera. Bam rewound the video footage to the critical moment when Stephen had disclosed that the information he provided was fake. Bam's sharp eyes scanned the footage, paying close attention to any subtle gestures or movements that could suggest one of the team leaders was involved in covert communication. A triumphant smirk graced Bam's lips as he pinpointed the moment of betrayal. His sharp eyes had caught the spy in the act, and now he held the evidence he needed to expose them. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, and subscribe. And if you'd like to contribute further, you can now buy me a coffee. Every little bit helps in creating more quality content for you. Just click the Buy Me a Coffee link in the description below. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss a new video.